Every day, you essentially pay your dues by doing the harder thing when it's the right thing to do. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, this podcast we are doing here on pretty much everything that I could possibly offer you on hip injuries in gymnastics. And so um, for those of you who are maybe familiar with this, um, you may have uh, seen we've done a lot of these podcasts over the last six months or so. We've tried to do these really big, comprehensive, um, everything you could possibly want um, related to these injuries. And if you're new, welcome. How are you? Um, my name is Dave Tilly. I am the CEO of Shift. And I am also a sports physical therapist. I did gymnastics my whole life in college uh, as well. And then I've been coaching gymnastics for about uh, 15 years or so now coming on cl probably close to like 20 now that I think about it. But essentially, um, you know, I have spent a lot of time in gymnastics. I've spent a lot of time treating gymnasts for hip injuries. Uh, and I've been really fortunate to work with a lot of um, club, you know, recreational uh, and competitive as well as uh, NCAA and elite international gymnast for a variety of injuries and hip injuries are very commonly one that we deal with. So uh, in true form of what we've been doing with these blogs and these podcasts is I really want to make a one stop shop for someone who is looking for information on gymnastics injuries. Okay, so whether that be, you know, uh, what are the common injuries? Um, why do they happen? What can you do to help with them? What exercises do you need? Um, what should you be looking for in realistic timelines? Um, what are the things that as a sporting culture, we need to really think about if we want to make a, a pretty substantial dent in the rates of injuries. So we're really going to kind of go through everything here. And my hope is that by the end of this, um, although it will be long and although it will be a little bit uh, more kind of in depth, um, we're going to timestamp everything, break it all up into categories so that you can find whatever you need on a certain injury or a certain topic. And this also is all in written form as well. So everything here in the video format is also up on our blog in a very long blog post. So you can hop around, look at exercises, do whatever you would like um, to try to find those things that you need. So um, our kind of outline here is we're going to start with just, you know, what are the uh, the rates of injuries for hip problems in gymnastics? Like what what is the different distribution of low versus medium versus higher intensity training? Um, what are the forces on the hip joint that we know? Um, why are there so many injuries? And what are some of those factors for what is causing those injuries? Uh, and then we're going to take a little bit of a detour and actually go through a pretty, pretty good breakdown of the anatomy. Um, you can skip this if you're someone who's not really interested in it. But if you really want to have a good understanding of what the common injuries are, are and how to help fix them and then prevent them, you really do have to understand the anatomy. That's crucial uh, if we really want to get through that. So we'll talk about the anatomy. And then we'll actually break down exactly what types of injuries are common. So we'll kind of break that up into like the front of the hip, the back of the hip, the inside of the hip, the outside of the hip very common injuries that gymnasts uh, kind of uh, deal with. We will then flow right into, okay, how do we deal with those, right? What are the, the phases of the rehabilitation process? If you're a medical provider or if you're a parent or a gymnast or a coach who's wanting to know what is a realistic progression of timeline, um, I'll kind of break down exactly what I do to treat people, what exercises I give them, you know, what things I do in the clinic. And then also we'll then break down some just bigger picture concepts to wrap up in terms of like, okay, what can we do to speed the healing timeline up? What can we do for some preventative or a prehab type exercises? Um, and what do we do if someone is really not having a, a good experience or maybe not having the most, uh, you know, progression back to sport? What if something is not going well and they're not getting better? How do we deal with some of those uh, challenging cases? Okay. So that's kind of our overview and we'll get started here. So when you look at the research on what are the rates, so some good studies are around. It's interesting because you'll see that, you know, although hip injuries don't uh, present as the, the most common thing in gymnastics for injuries, right? Ankle sprains and back pain are usually the highest. Um, hip injuries, I think, are unfortunately really present in our sport. A lot of people have hip injuries, have hip pain, whether it's like hip flexor issues, hamstring issues, um, groin pain labral tears. Um, a lot of people are having hip injuries, but they're not as commonly reported because I think a lot of people have overuse hip injuries that they unfortunately think are just normal and part of training. So these studies that I'll mention, they don't really show these really, really high rates, but they definitely um, reflect that, you know, there's something going on we need to dig deeper into. So here in 2015 showed that 4.8% of the injuries from 2009 to 2014 in the NCAA were hip injuries. Marshall, a little bit farther back in 2017, showed around the same rate, 49 I was way back in 1989 to 2004. Um, Chandra is a more recent study in the college gymnastics situation from 2014 to 19. They showed about 3.9 injury uh, percent of the, all the injuries. 
And then when you look at some of the elite and sub elite categories, we see that, you know, Colt showed in 99 that 5.7% of injuries in the sub elite or elite gymnastics realm were hip injuries. And then saloon is a pre-collegiate study um, that looked at about 3.1% being all the injuries. So you look anywhere between three point, you know, three to five, three to six percent. It's not a ton of injuries per, you know, the bigger picture of all these people in these studies. So I think that tells me two things. One, they're probably underreported. We probably have a lot of gymnasts who are suffering in silence with, you know, hip flexor issues, groin issues, hamstring issues. Um, and they don't just, they don't, you know, present those to research studies or they don't go to the doctor for them and they don't end up needing something really, really um, substantial until it's a really bad injury that might require, you know, injections or medicine or surgery or something like that. So it's probably underreported. Number two is it tells me that a massive percentage of all these are probably overuse and are probably things that we can make progress around, right? Like accidents, like fractures or, you know, things that really unfortunately just are, are freak, freak, uh, you know, moments in time where they fall and they go to the ER those are probably the ones that are reported. So it's probably that a lot of these injuries are underreported, that a lot of these injuries are also just progressive, slow overuse. And I think when you look at the factors for why these things happen, it makes sense about what's going on here. Okay, so that's just the rates there. If you look at the forces on gymnastics, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of great research specifically on, okay, what what does the hip joint experience during a switch leap or during a stalder, right? Or doing some sort of like flare work for men's pommel horse. We don't know those forces one, because they're insanely hard to study. And two, because it'd be very, very tricky for us to narrow in specifically on getting, you know, sensors inside the hip. You'd have to do what are called in vivo studies in dwelling force or some way to do it, you know, in open chain. And uh, that's like ethically challenging, but it's also very, very complicated from a, a research measurement point of view. Um, but we do know that the landing forces are astronomical in gymnastics. And that's a huge part of, of part of these injuries. So the peak ground reaction of gymnastics forces on the leg, which you could infer to the hip is between 8.8 .8 to 4.2% of uh, sorry, 4.2 times body weight. It doesn't mean that all that force is going through the hip. It just means that that force is experienced by the leg, right? Or the entire lower body um, in controlled settings it's around 15 times body weight and the highest recorded forces from like dismounts and uh you know those really really high impact things are anywhere between 18 to 30 times body weight which is mind-blowing when you think about it but like i said most of the um most of the injuries that we deal with in in the hip in particular some are related to like sprinting and running. So hamstrings kind of fall in that category. Some are related to landing, right? Like landing and having some, some hip pain in the front. But a lot of these things in gymnastics come to these very unique, weird skills that we'll talk about that make, you know, gymnasts use their arms as legs and legs as arms. So because the legs are being used as arms, but the hip joint is not necessarily built for it. These large ranges of motion, these large forces and like switch leaps and switch rings and over splits, right? These kind of things are probably the biggest uh, drivers of a lot of these hip issues. And that is where unfortunately the, the research lacks in telling us what those forces are. So we know they're there. We don't know exactly what they are, but an interesting study that did come out for this is there was a study looking at ballerinas who are doing uh, straddle splits on essentially like an x-ray or a radiograph, right? So they took these uh, ballet dancers, these elite ballet dancers, and they put them on um, an x-ray table and they had them do a full split to a, a 180 degree split and it showed that in order for that to happen there had to be some subluxation of the hip joint right so this is why mitchell um and i think greer and a couple other people from the journal of arthroscopy in 2016 i want to say this one's from but essentially what they did is they looked at those split radiographs and they saw that in order to do that you had to sublux your hip out slightly i think it was 10 you know just over 10 centimeters is essentially the subluxing that was average so while that doesn't tell us the forces of the hip joint it does tell us that to get to these end ranges and do these skills it's a lot of it's a lot of stress on the hip joint to move those joint capsules up and down and cause that so again you can pull out these pieces of information right and understand that okay if a, a regular oversplit or just a regular split causes this micro subluxation, and we've also seen this in other x-rays from gymnasts doing oversplits, getting x-rays at the front of their hip does sublux a little bit. We can probably infer that if you took those positions and dynamically swung your legs very, very hard into those positions, you'd probably be putting enormous stress on the hip joint, right? The hip joint, the hip joint capsule, the labrum, and the muscles around the hip, the, very, the small ones we'll talk about to stabilize the hip, like the glutes and the hip rotators and the groin.
they have to be really, really strong. And also on top of that, you need to have really good overall strength of your core and of your hip and overall strength uh, of your lower body to handle these types of forces. Okay. So that's kind of where my brain goes to when that stuff kind of comes up. And along with that, I think that tells us that it's really, really uh, important that we are understanding where this motion is coming from. It is very common, like I said, for um, gymnasts to be very, very hypermobile, but also still have joint soft tissue restrictions. So what I mean by that is that you can be loose and tight at the same time. You can have hypermobility of your joint capsules, but you can also have stiffness in your muscles themselves from overuse. And so gym is squeeze their legs together. They're doing these jumps and these leaps that really high forces at end range. These things can cause progressive soft tissue stiffness. And again, it makes us really have to think twice about, okay, what are we doing for flexibility? What are we doing for strengthening? If we know these forces are extreme at end range, you know, what are we going to do to help protect athletes against those? Okay. So that's just a little bit of the force overview. And again, keep in mind that we haven't measured all the hardest skills. We don't really know exactly what the hardest skills are doing to these hip joints. Uh, and also the, the, a lot of these times are underreported, right? A lot of people are not saying, oh, my hip hurts with this or with that. But we, we have this idea that yes, we know the forces are very, very high from landing and from uh, active flexibility work or from all sorts of different tumbling and stuff like that. That's going to be really important to keep in mind. But your brain shifts automatically to, okay, why? Why are there so many injuries in gymnastics, right? I can't tell you the last time I talked to a gymnast who didn't have some sort of a, a cranky hip flexor or a hamstring issue when they were younger or ongoing chronic popping and some, some like soreness here and there in their groin. So what's going on here? And I have a list here of all these things that we'll go through. Okay. So number one, back to my first point that gymnasts use their legs like arms. Okay. The leg and the hip joint in particular is really designed for weight bearing. It's designed for, you know, walking around, running and jumping, right? It has this very, very deep hip socket that is made to take high forces. Now, what happens there is that because you have such a high, you know, uh, high congruency of deep, deep hip socket, you don't have that flexibility available. So it's good and it's bad, right? It's good because we want that stability. We want that ability to walk and run and, and do the things that we do upright. But in a sport like gymnastics that wants very extreme jumps and leaps and flexibility demands and very aggressive in bar skills like stalders or endos or pancakes, it's going to make it very challenging for, for this uh, hip joint to get into those positions. So some athletes, they are born with, you know, good luck where they have some, some hypermobility. They also have some bone structure that allows them to do these positions and they have really good soft tissue flexibility. They're probably going to have an easier time getting into those positions. It's probably why they're so good at gymnastics, a natural selection type point of view allowed them to do basics and skills when they were younger that people said that, Ooh, wow, you're kind of naturally flexible. Let's keep doing gymnastics. Okay. Vice versa. Those who do not inherently have that, that bony structure and that hypermobility, they're probably not going to do well with these extreme ranges of motion. It's not to say they can't do gymnastics, but it's just to say that we have to appreciate that there are many different types of, of body types and different types of uh, body profiles and hip joints that can do different skills. You might not be the most super hypermobile ballet flexible dancer in the world. There's many other power based skills that you can do to, to try to get those requirements and try to get to the sport successfully. So we have to know that inherently the hip joint is not built for this mobility. It does have more stability, but we can tailor our adjustments and tailor our training programs based on what the athletes in front of us need. If we have some tools for screening, if we work with medical providers to make sure we, we break down, okay, what is not really available for range of motion or what is okay. So that's, the, that's number one is that this mismatch between maybe flexibility that the sport demands and natural inherent mobility of the hip joint is going to maybe predispose some more overuse type injuries or overstretching type injuries. Second to that, the sporting uh, culture of gymnastics still has a lot of work to do an understanding like the repetition count, right? There's an enormous amount of repetitions that are needed to learn skills. And I'm a fan of these skills. I'm a fan of high level gymnastics, but sometimes I think what happens is we really don't have a, uh, you know, a, a lasso, so to speak, or barriers to how much someone is doing. It's this open ended, let's just do a bunch of switch leaves. Let's just do a bunch of vaults. Let's just do a bunch of sprints and see how many we can do. That sometimes is dangerous because we can easily see someone between uh, a male gymnast, for example, between all the in-bar work, all the pommel horse work, all maybe the floor flare work and all the ring work they're doing, it's very easy for that plus dismounts to add up to a lot of cranky hip joints, okay? For women's artistic gymnastics, of course, 
all the stuff on beam for switch leaps and jumps and all that kind of stuff, all the stuff on floor, then combined with the sprinting and running of vault and combined with the in bars of bars, your hips are doing tons and tons and tons of work. Rhythmic gymnastics is obviously its own kind of league, right? Where there's so much hypermobility needed. If we don't essentially keep some sort of um, guidance on what we're doing for repetitions, it's very, very easy to let these hip joints get really, really high numbers and then become cranky. Okay. On top of that, as I mentioned, these really high repetitions are all really high for skills. Typically even drills and even progressions and even basic stuff, they still require quite a bit of work on the hip. So just doing cartwheel step-ins or just doing active flexibility or just doing some stall bar work, right. Or just doing some um, metal bar and low bar work for in bars. It still is a lot of force on the hip. So while not everything is these extreme, you know, very, very high force skills, all of these things really are adding up. So if we have high repetitions, right, and we have high forces, and then as I mentioned fourth year, we have high ranges of motion of these skills, you can probably see why all these things are coming together to overstress the hip joint, right? We take a young athlete, right? And they're doing a ton of repetitions with new skills they're trying to learn. And these skills like jumps and leaps and active flexibility require very extreme ranges of motion. Those all will come together to be why someone's hip flexor keeps getting sore or someone's hamstring growth plate starts to get irritated. So I'm not saying we can't do these things. I'm saying we have to be really proactive and understand that these things exist, the high forces, the high ranges of motion, the high repetitions and plan for these things. We can't just throw a bunch of random drills at athletes and say, hey, let's just do these because they're, they're new they're new. I saw them on Instagram or blah, blah, blah. You have to be calculated with how you slowly implement them. Try a little bit the first day, give them a day off to, to get away from those new drills. Then try them again on Wednesday when their hips are maybe a little bit less uh, sore and more recovered. Also shuffling around some of the events. If we do a lot of jumps and leaps on dance and beam, we may not want to do all that on floor and then also do a lot of in bar work on bars. We might want to try to switch the focus of our events around just a little bit to make sure we're not overloading things too much. Okay. For uh, fifth year, and I save this one towards the middle because I know this one's a sensitive topic, but the brutal reality is that we really are not using um, the most current evidence-based up-to-date uh, flexibility methods in gymnastics, right? We have seen a lot of really good progress being made. Um, a lot of people are taking the time to, to read the research and understand maybe what is different. We thought we knew, you know, 10 years ago versus what we know now. And so what happens though, is that still, unfortunately, the best current research has not really made its way into gymnastics training. Okay. And so what I mean by that is that, remember I said, you can be loose jointed and tight at the same time, right? This means that you can have really hypermobile joint capsules, but still have really stiff, soft tissues. And what this creates is a situation where maybe if we use some of the, the more old school two minute plus holds on over splits, or we're doing these long, really intense passive stretches, um, what it means is that maybe the joint capsules themselves are getting more of the pressure because the soft tissue is not as flexible as it should be. If you don't have the muscular flexibility and you're already hypermobile, you're probably going to put more pressure on the joint capsules, particularly if you're not doing specific stretches that are really aimed at the hip flexor or the quad or the groin. And I'll share some of those with you. Okay. So not everyone's doing these like three plus minute long, crazy holds, right? There are some people, unfortunately, who are still just doing what they think is best and they don't really understand the new research. But, you know, a lot of research is these big uh, systematic reviews by like Thomas et al. And some other really great papers that show that maybe it's just more about consistency over intensity and doing things slowly over time. So maybe two sets of 30 seconds of a very specific soft tissue by a stretch five to six days per week is probably the best dosage that we think we have right now versus these one or two days per week where you do this epic flexibility circuit and you do these two, three, four plus minute holds with lots of active flexibility drills and stuff like that. Okay. And along with that, I think there's still this misunderstanding inside the gymnastics culture that when we stretch, we're making muscles longer, right? Within a session. Now, maybe we're getting some passive element stretching, some, some tenderness papers. There are some papers out there that show, you know, that the passive elements are stretching a little bit, but the majority of the research, particularly like Conrad in 2010 was a really good paper. Uh, Wepler in 2014 was a really good paper. They show us that maybe what's happening with consistent stretching to a just an, an uncomfortable enough dose is that we're desensitizing the nervous system, right? We're desensitizing these things called nociceptors, which detect this threat or this danger. And maybe we're also desensitizing some of the areas in the brain that are detecting this really intense stretch. As you do this consistently every day with the right dosage and you back it up with other things, we probably make these changes stick because the body is getting used to the discomfort of stretching. Okay. And I don't really want to go really far down the rabbit hole and be a nerdville here and, and kind of share the specifics of the methods of the studies. But a lot of these papers show us that while the, the length of the muscles themselves long-term does not change, 
the range of motion does change. And that kind of makes you scratch your head and you say, okay, well, why? If the muscle's not getting longer, what's left over is again, probably that tolerance to stretch. Okay. So that's really important to think about too, as well, from a science-based point of view. And third, before we move on here is that in order to actually change that muscle yourself, uh, you probably need to actually do some loaded work. You need to do some evidence-based uh, eccentrics, strength conditioning, some things that help load the area and cause that, that true length over time and cause you to use that range of motion so that your body hangs on to it a little bit, right? There's the, the structural point of view. You could argue like, okay, we're actually getting length and, and time. Like eccentrics uh, promote what's called sarcomere genesis sometimes, which allows muscles to truly get longer. But you can also make the argument that maybe your body is neurologically going to use the range of motion and keep the range of motion if you consistently do it, right? If you always, you know, squat to a certain depth or do splits to a certain length, your body's going to keep understanding, oh yeah, this is how far we go. This is how far we go. Okay. That probably will change things structurally over time more so than just passive stretching. So all these things kind of come together just to kind of summarize that there's a lot of great science out there, particularly in the last five to 10 years that has come out. And I really feel as though we have to do a better job of incorporating it into the the day to day training, particularly as it relates to, you know, hip flexibility, quads, hip flexors, groins, splits, jumps, leaps, you know, active flexibility is great. I believe we should be stretching every day in a warm up dynamic and a little bit of static stretching here as the research supports it. But it's more about a holistic view based on what all the research says the research supports soft tissue work, it supports um, some uh, regular stretching, right? Specific muscle-based stretching based on the anatomy, right? It supports eccentrics. It supports uh, strength conditioning programs. These are the things we want to be using consistently to really make sure we're getting the best of that that you know muscle-specific stretching. We want to bias the muscles because the joint capsules probably are already a little loose jointed. So that being said, on that, it's really important to study the anatomy as we'll talk about because the anatomy dictates what types of stretching are the most effective, right? Like that deep hip flexor lunge that we see also commonly everywhere. Yes, it's aesthetically pleasing and it has a time and it has a place. And I want to, I want people to know, I, I encourage those things to be done like in dance circuits, but if you have somebody with a very, very stiff hip joint and you're trying to get them more mobile, doing that deep overarched back position where the hip flexor actually starts at the spine. If you understand the anatomy, we're probably not getting the most out of that stretch for the hip flexor. Okay. So those are just little tweaks we need to understand how to make is, okay, how do we tweak these things to get the specific muscle stretching we need for splits and for jumps and for leaps, but also protect the hip joint as well. All right. Next, moving on here, a couple more. Uh, the seventh one I want to talk about here is that, sorry, the sixth one is that we have to understand that, you know, young athletes in the sport of gymnastics, they're pretty much kids, right? The majority of people that we're working with are under the age of 18 and almost the massive amounts are under the age of 15, right? Shout out to adult gymnastics. I love recreational adult gymnastics. Do it for the rest of your life. But a lot of these hip injuries that we see are happening in really young kids who have open growth plates. Okay. They are not at the peak of their strength and their power from a hormonal or a puberty point of view. And they're just not developmentally there understanding how to activate their muscles, how to have high body tension, how to really put good strength and conditioning into place, right? So they are also going to be someone who is challenging sometimes to, to keep these uh, safety wise, because they, they're just not really quite all developed yet, right? And I mean that in terms of physically developed, mentally developed. We don't want to expose a 10 year old or a 12 year old with open growth plates to these extremely high jumps and leap circuits all the time because it might irritate the growth plate of their hamstring. Okay. We have to be very smart and very intelligent and go slow to make sure that we are dosing these things appropriately. We can work them. We can, you know, definitely develop the ideas. We can do them on a regular basis, but they do not have the same tolerance that an 18 year old or a 20 year old or a 25 year old has who has closed growth plates, right? And is mentally very much uh, more acuity, has more acuity to understand why they're doing flexibility work or why they're doing jumps and leaps. And they're also much, much more, uh, you know, developed in terms of strength and power. They have a lot more dynamic muscular support to protect the joints that are kind of getting these end range high forces. So that's another one that I think is really, really important is oftentimes glazed over, um, along with the evidence-based strength, or sorry, the evidence-based flexibility, I almost gave it away is the evidence-based strength conditioning, right? We need to keep in incorporating science-based flexibility methods, but also science-based strength conditioning methods. And if you look at the research on one of the best ways to build strength for things to protect the hip joints, it's doing some weight training. It's doing some cross training. I know I always, you know, pretty much die on this hill every time I give these lectures, these podcasts, but I really believe that the future of gymnastics is this hybrid model. So things like split squats and single leg RDLs and um, proper proper squatting and hinging patterns, not only will they double down and help some of these flexibility things, they're also going to protect the hip joints against these high forces, right? 
And often, almost times when I bring this up, people instantly think about football programs. They think about benching 315 pounds. They think about doing, you know, bicep curls and super, super heavy squats, right? That's really not what we're going for when we want a gymnast to weight train. We're talking about very specific sports performance programs, right? And we have a lot of great pod, uh, podcasts and blogs on this, but we're talking about very specific exercises that will complement the gymnastics training, right? And the perfect one I always give is something like a rear foot elevated and a front foot elevated uh, split squat. So split squat is kind of like a lunge and you slowly lower down and lower up, but we can give somebody a gymnast, uh, you know, bilaterally elevated split squats with a nice slow three second tempo and a three second pause. That is really going to help develop the flexibility into that split position. It's also going to build that protective end range, right? We're going to get that athlete down to end range and we're going to work on holding and pausing to build the strength to do that later in a switch leap or later when they're sprinting or running and load the hamstring. If we take that, and we complement it with something like a, you know, um, a, sl a slider split eccentric, right? Hands on blocks, slowly down the slider. Between the two of those things, we're building up some great capacity of the hamstring to handle that end range force and of the back legs, hip joint and hip flexor to control that motion, right? So instead of just throwing switch leap drills at them, we can build up their foundational capacity with this nice hybrid base strength conditioning. So there's an enormous amount of research out there that weight training is, is you know, not going to make someone lose their flexibility as we covered. It's not going to make them automatically get bulky. It's not going to make them just all of a sudden lose all their skills and get hurt. Like these things are all myths that are propagated inside of our culture, unfortunately still. But if you take a step back and you look at the reality of great strength and conditioning programs and the research, you can see that there is enormous benefit, right? And we have 30 gymnasts, you know, every summer that come and train with us, college, uh, elite, um, club level, they have just phenomenal things to say about not only their strength and their power, but also how it maintains their hip flexibility, their shoulder flexibility, because we build these comprehensive programs. Okay. All right. Moving on to some more now. Number eight is uh, just landing techniques. Still have to get some uh, some progress here. Wishing great progress in terms of judges changing the way they judge. Um, coaches teaching the proper landing patterns. But if you do unfortunately still use that little bit old school uh, kind of hips tucked under upright position, really knee dominant, uh, it puts quite a bit of stress on the hip joint and it can make it very easy for you to kind of get some what they call FAI or like femoral acetabular impingement in the front of your hip joint. Very, very easy to have some crankiness in your hip uh, if you're not landing properly. So we want to make sure athletes are landing landing in a squat based pattern. They understand how to squat to depth. They understand how to control that hip hinging motion to load the hamstrings, load the glutes so that those can take over some of the, uh, the pressure and the forces on their, on their hip joints. Okay. And then two that are paired together, um, early specialization in year round training. So early specialization means, um, starting only one sport from a very, very young age, uh, and not doing any other sport. And then year round training refers to not having any period of time where you're not doing that sport. Okay. So both of these things, unfortunately are very, very prominent in the sports and the, and the gymnastics culture. And so the research on this is pretty clear. Um, early specialization and year-round training both substantially elevate the risk of overall injury as well as burnout. Um, and so maybe if we have gymnasts that are starting at the age of three and they only do gymnastics from the age of five, they don't do any other sports, no soccer, no swimming, no anything else. Um, we're just going to put a lot of pressure on their hips over and over and over. It's the same jumps, the same leaps, the same running, the same drills, right? I'm a big fan of gymnasts doing, uh, you know, gymnastics when they're younger and getting a head start, especially if they have lofty goals, but to have them only do one sport from the age of five is really going to put them in a tough spot to not make sure they don't have any hip or back problems. Um, and then also year round training too. Like I know some places that literally only give two weeks off total throughout the year, including holidays after, uh, after, you know, season is done and, and I get it. Gymnastics is fun. You want to train new skills. You want to be in the gym with your friends, but Again, there's a really, really high risk of overuse injury uh, globally if you don't take any time away from your sport and take care of yourself and let your body calm down. So I think that gymnastics needs a relative off season. We don't need, you know, three months, but I think a solid two weeks off after our hardest competition and then maybe a two week slow ramp up, maybe extending the preseason so that we're not starting meets so early and condensing down the meet season. So it's not 11 meets throughout the entire year um, from like, you know, like <laughs> September or like some people start like October, November and go towards like May. It's like the longest season of all time. If we, if we change things around and just shuffled it a little bit and, and taught about how not only is it going to help with health, it's going to dramatically help performance. Um, I think we would get a lot of really good traction there. So uh, number 11, uh, we need some science-based workload and wellness monitoring programs. That's for dorks like me to figure out with research studies is to figure out, okay, how hard is gymnastics practice and how do we monitor these things? How do we track these things? How do we give coaches tools to really make educated decisions about how someone's feeling or how someone's training is going? Um, that is definitely a factor here that's for all injuries, but you know, hip and lower back ones come to for sure.
Uh, number 12 is this is on the technical side. I think sometimes, unfortunately, we are still skipping steps. We are not teaching absolutely flawless cartwheel and round off and handstand technique. Maybe not teaching athletes how to really engage their glutes and then their core when they do active flexibility, when they do jumps and leaps. We're kind of just jumping to the fun stuff for a little bit too often, right? Or we're maybe not doubling down on doing basics every single day. If you have these, uh, you know, slightly flawed basics, they're going to show up and rear their ugly head down the road when someone starts to do much, much harder skills. And it could easily make a situation where the hamstring or the hip flexor gets overworked because we're not optimally using the equipment, right? We're not optimally using the springs or bouncing the the bar to do our stallers instead of just ripping our, fit, our feet underneath us really, really hard, which can put a lot of stress on the hip joint. So that's also something I think I always like refer to people like Nick Ruddick and many other fantastic people in the space who have great drills great progressions, really understanding that foundational technique and, and what basics should be done every single day. I think that's really, really important for everyone to understand medical providers, coaches, parents, that a, a, a program that does a lot of basics and a lot of strength conditioning, as boring as it is, um, that really is the key to success, right? It's not only about all the flashy skills. There's, there's definitely a time and a place that, to throw skills and enjoy yourself and, and really enjoy the sport, but um, just throwing them all the time is going to be going to be sometimes tough. Okay. Lastly, just to mention number 13 is going to be equipment and technology, right? Obviously, the equipment of the spring floor and different events is ridiculously uh, more complex and advanced than 20 years ago in the sport. So as technology evolves, the forces on the, the body uh, evolve. And obviously that brings with it, you know, the, uh, the challenge on the hip joint. And you could also argue the code has gotten much harder as well. So the, uh, you know, the amount of jumps and leaps that have to be high level D level skills or people shooting for E level jumps and leaps. Um, a lot of those obviously have progressed over time and that just makes the sport harder. So yeah. So that's kind of the first chunk there is just to get through the, you know, the big picture of like, okay, what are the forces? What, why are these things happening? You know, um, what are the baseline uh, reasons that maybe these things are elevated? Excuse me. And now we want to take a big step back and we actually want to go through some pretty, um, pretty big, uh, sections on, on anatomy. Okay. So I'm going to, um, actually share my screen right here, because I think that this part is probably really important for people to understand, um, what's going on here from a, from a, a bony point of view. So I will share my screen here. That way, I think this is just a little bit easier to see. So I'm not going to um, blow the PowerPoint up all the way because I want to make sure I can see where my slides are going. But um, I wanted to pull this part out of one of the courses that we have because I think this helps people really understand. So um, at the base layer, I'm going to look over here. So apologize if you're watching the video. Um, at the base layer, right, the, the osteochondral or hip layer one, right, there's, there's five layers to the hip here that are best to kind of um, go about. So the pelvic base has the pubis, the ilium, and the ischium, Okay. On the, the pelvis side, you have what's called the acetabulum, which is kind of like the bowl of the hip. And then on the other side, you have the femur bone. So the head of the femur goes into the, the um, hip joint called the acetabulum. That is the, the hip joint itself, okay? We're going to skip a lot of the dorky stuff here. I just want to show these pictures and understand it, right? On this side, we have a lot of important things, and I'll zoom in to make it a little bit uh, less overwhelming. But we essentially have a lot of things here. This is the hip joint itself, right? And we have this big, deep hip socket around here. This is the side view. This is our sit bone back here, our ischium, which is where our hamstring attaches, right? This is going to be the ilium up here, which is the broader kind of thing you can feel on the outside of your hip. And then we also have the pubis down here, right? So these things all together help us kind of go together. So pubis bone being back here, right? Sorry, sacrum bone being back here, pubis in the front, ischium down here. Ilium. And you don't need to know all this if you're not a medical provider, but essentially just looking at the shape of this, we can understand that this is kind of the socket side of things. So we have a socket side. And then on the other side, I can show an x-ray here, we have the femur intersecting here. So this is the head of the femur, right? That goes right into this ball. This is the, the ball right here. This is the socket right here. This makes the hip joint, right? And so with this, we have this underlying, like I said, this, this kind of more stable structure that doesn't have a ton of mobility. This really deep hip socket is what allows someone to have a, a nice, you know, stable hip, but it also is sometimes challenging when somebody wants to do really hyper mobile activities, right? So we want to make sure we have this socket, this congruency. Some gymnasts will have a, uh, a more shallow hip joint called the dysplastic hip, um, which is where essentially they have less coverage and some will have a much, much deeper um, hip socket there as well. So just to kind of give you some uh, nerdy moments, right? But uh, covers about 170 degrees. It has a slight uh, forward projection and actually an inward projection as well. So that allows it to kind of tilt anterior and laterally. And then we have an angle of inclination, it's called, which is the angle between the femoral head and the neck, about of 130 degrees. Uh, it's slightly antiverted as well. 
Okay. So like I said, inherently it's built for more stability and less mobility, which is part of the, the equation. But, um, we have a little bit more, uh, coverage of the hip joint in the back, less in the front, which allows us to flex our hip up and do these really big kicks in front, right. But not get our leg behind us as much between the, um, the bony coverage and then also some ligaments and stuff like that. We'll talk about in a second, not as much flexibility naturally behind us, but a lot more flexibility, right? You can put your knee to your face for some gymnasts. You cannot put your, the back of your knee to the back of your head, right? It doesn't work that way. So that a lot of that is from a bony point of view and also from ligaments and soft tissue point of view. So that's kind of base layer one. I really, I don't, don't want to go super in depth, but when you have a look at a couple more things here, some, some notable structures, if you want to take a peek at these. Um, but essentially what we're trying to understand is that these, um, different uh, socket orientations allow us to then be stable and move somewhat, but we need more, right? We can't just have these, uh, these bones or else it wouldn't really work well for moving our leg around. Okay. So when we go into the next layer, what we have is essentially what are called the capsules in the ligaments. Okay. And the way to think about the capsules, I know there's sometimes really stressful and overwhelming is that we essentially have three, um, we have a saran wrap type structure that is wrapped around that, that ball and socket joint called the joint capsule. Okay. The, um, ligaments, these large ligaments that I'll talk about are essentially thickenings or extensions of that capsule that help to just package everything together. Okay. Remember big stability joint. So we need lots of, uh, stress coming through the hip joint that has to be dealt with. So these ligaments and these joint capsules really help us to do that. Okay. They are, uh, some are on the front, some are underneath, some are on the back. And they, they obviously will limit different ranges of motion based on that. The ones in the front will limit the leg going backwards. The leg, uh, the, the ones underneath will limit the leg going out to the side. And the ones in the back of the joint will limit the legs going straight ahead this way. Okay. So we'll break these down one by one and then we'll talk about the labrum, which is another thing that a lot of people talk about um, and is, is definitely important to understand. So the first big ligament to understand is called the Y ligament or the ligament of Bigelow. Okay. So for the dorks out there, this one's for you. If you don't care about this stuff, skip ahead 20 minutes and just, you know, get to the injury section. But I think it's important to understand this stuff. Okay. So the proximal attachment of the Y ligament is the anterior inferior iliac spine. Okay. The splits um, have two splits that go across. One is the lateral arm, one is the medial arm. The lateral arm is going obliquely inserting onto the anterior prominence of the greater trochanter. The medial arm is going inferiorly and is inserting onto the anterior femur at the level about of the greater trochanter. Okay. So we have this split and you can kind of see that here in this great article from Weber and Cal Spart, um, is that you can see that split kind of going on. Now, what that's going to do is that's going to allow us to have some limits on certain motions, right? So this ligament is going to limit external rotation when the hip is flexed all the way up because that end range, but more importantly, when the leg is behind us in extension, it's going to limit the rotation inward and outward and that end range hip extension. So that's the back leg of a switch leap, right? That's the back leg of an oversplit, the leg that's on the ground. This ligament is very much helping to check that range of motion so we don't have any substantial issues. And what happens is when the leg goes back, generally the femur is sliding forward in the joint. So if you think about this is the ball in the socket, my leg is underneath me, I bring my back leg into a switch leap and it slides the hip joint forward, right? This anterior capsule and this iliofemoral ligament is going to prevent the anterior mo motion of the femoral head too far. And the reason that's important is because obviously things like the labrum or other structures like the hip flexor and stuff lie right ahead of this. And so you can have some issues where somebody is, is really pushing too much pressure on the front of their hip joint. And this ligament is going to help protect that. Okay. The second ligament is going to be the pubofemoral ligament. And this originates on the front of the joint, the anterior acetabulum. It's going to travel down and back, right? So inferior and posterior wrapping around the femoral head, kind of like a hammock. And it's going to insert really not anywhere specifically in a, on a bone, but it's going to blend in with the other joint capsules. Okay. So it's not going to be this distinct bony insertion. It's going to have its own kind of blended in. And the reason this is happening is because this really is a big, uh, uh, check rein to, to certain ranges of motion and inferior motion. So it goes underneath and wraps under like a hammock. So when somebody abducts their leg or puts their leg in a straddle split and the, and the hip joint is moving downward, cause again, leg out to the side, hip goes opposite motion down. This pubofemoral ligament is very much checking that because it's a hammock or a sling that wraps under the femoral head. So, so far we have the one in the front is checking that backwards motion and that rotation. The one underneath is checking the downward motion of the femoral head, right? That's the second one, the pubofemoral ligament. And the third one is going to be the one that allows for a lot of kicking motion in front, the ischiofemoral ligament. So this one starts on the ischial and acetabular margin. It spirals up and around superior laterally as a single band and inserts onto the base of the greater trochanter. 
And this one, as you can see here in the picture, is going to be in the more so the back of the joint. So it's going to allow a lot of kicking range of motion because it has more, uh, you know, kind of um, redundancy to allow a big, big kick. And again, there's less bony uh, over coverage here. Um, so what this allows us to do is that there's going to be more so, or sorry, there's less bony coverage in the front of the hip joint. So the femur can slide up farther. Um, but what this one is going to do is it's going to limit the internal rotation during a flex position and at end range and extension, and it's really going to restrict that, that big posterior sliding, right? So when you hug your knees to your, your chest, the hip joint goes backwards and down. And because we have a lot of space in the bony, uh, structures in the front to allow that your hip is really built for this flexing motion, but this is going to limit this uh, ischiofemoral ligament will limit that end range of uh, IR and flexion together. Okay. So those are the, um, the, the major ligaments. Okay. There is one more called the, uh, sorry, two more, I guess the ligamentum teres is going to be this, um, you know, kind of smaller, uh, ligament that's inside of the hip joint and attaches up to the, uh, the fovea and the capitis, right? It's really more so for like blood flow, there are some thoughts that it's like a joint position sensor too as well for proprioception, but it's more so inside the hip joint. So it goes from the femoral head right across. And we do have this zone uh, orticularis or, or I can never pronounce one orbicularis. There we go. That's essentially uh, just limiting the traction of the joint. So it wraps all the way around kind of in this like suction seal along with the labrum and it helps prevent this traction force that would maybe would distract the joint a little bit. So those are the main kind of um, ligament structures, so the capsules and the ligaments. I do want to take a moment to go back and highlight something very important, which is going to be the labrum. Labrum, okay. So the labrum essentially, as you can see here in this picture, and I'll zoom in for a second, the labrum is essentially this fibrocartilage tissue that helps to kind of line the inner socket and it deepens the socket, but it also provides a vacuum seal and more stability. Okay. So it really helps to kind of suck the ball of the head in there and keep it nice and secure. It's very, very important for many things. Okay. So one, is it helps increase the acetabular volume and it helps increase the acetabular contact. It helps spread force out across the hip joint, right? Really, really high forces coming through the hip joint, right? With walking and running and jumping and sprinting. So if we just had like the bone on the bone uh, to cartilage, it might be too much and there might not be enough shock absorption. Similar to how we have like a meniscus in the knee, which is also a fibrocartilage structure. This is a horseshoe shaped structure that has a good thickness of three to eight millimeters and, and uh, sorry, five millimeters and some, some really broad width up to eight millimeters. It's going to allow us to take those high forces of impact and, and move the hip joint around without having any, any wear and tear, so to speak. Okay. So it kind of acts as that buffer, but it also acts as a really important seal of like an intraarticular pressure is maintained, which means that it allows a lot lot more, um, you know, force distribution. And also it really helps to keep that suction going. If we didn't have that suction, it's a lot more sliding of the hip joint all around. And that is what happens with micro instability. If we have a labral tear or we have some hypermobility plus some damage, it's very easy for the hip joint to start sliding around way more at those extreme ranges of motion. When you extend your leg all the way back, if those bones run out of room and the femoral head is sliding forward and you have a labral tear and you don't have this vacuum seal, you're probably going to get more motion of the femoral head and that can cause some hip flexor strain, some groin strain, some labral damage. And this is a really common mechanism we see in gymnastics is these extreme end ranges of high force like I talked about causing the labrum to become irritated over time. Okay. So we need this labrum to really protect against some of these things. It's really, really important to buffer and transfer load. It maintains that vacuum seal. And there was a great paper from Shu that showed that a loss of that suction seal, it needs about 60% less force to distract the hip. So if we lose that seal, it's really, it's quite a bit easier to distract the hip, which means slide the hip around a little bit. And again, that might start to beat up some of the soft tissue, some of the joints, some of the cartilage, stuff like that. The labrum itself can become more irritable. And it does have some healing capacities, more so in the front of the anterior labrum, has more blood flow, not as much as the back, um, but also it, it has more thickening right uh, on the backside than the front side. So that's again, why you hear about a lot of labral tears in the front and the inside because of the less thickness there and uh, unfortunately more predisposition to get some irritation. Okay. So that's layer two, right? And then we're going to move on to layer three, which is what a lot of people will probably be more familiar with is going to be all the muscles, right? And I don't want to go like, you know, a six hour dissertation here and all the muscles that we need, but essentially it's easy to break these things up into the front, the back, the inside and the outside, like quadrants or compartments, because when you get to injuries, that's also how to think about these things. Okay. Is the pain in the front, the back, the inside, the outside, what structures are underneath there that could be irritable and what structures also are around them that we can work on and try to help get some capacity with. Okay. So on the front here, as you can see, um, we have the front, we have some, the, the hip flexor itself. I want to just highlight a couple things that are important on the hip flexor. Please note that it starts up here from the spine. Okay. The psoas major and um, minor muscles start up here from the spine, the levels of like three L three to L five. 
they cross across the front of the hip joint and then they insert onto the hip after blending with the uh, iliacus here. And the reason I bring this up is because when you think about, again, hip flexor stretching, if I have a really overarched lower back, I'm actually slacking the hip flexor here. So instead, what needs to happen is I need to tuck my hips under, squeeze my glute muscles, get my core locked in because that will be a true hip flexor bias. Same thing with the quad, right? The rectus femoris has one muscle that starts from way up here. The rectus femoris is one of the four quad muscles. It starts way up here on the pelvis, goes down across the knee and starts down to the bottom of the shin. So again, if I'm trying to stretch my quads and I have a really overarched position and I'm bending my leg up, I'm probably tipping my pelvis forward into an anterior tilt and I'm not really biasing this quad stretch. You, it's interesting to see some really high level athletes that I've worked with, high level gymnasts who come in and they like, you know, say, they say they have hip issues. We tweak their hip flexor and their quad stretch and they feel raging quad and hip flexor stretch they've never felt before just because we're biasing the muscles and we're taking some pressure off the joint capsules. Okay. And then we also have some smaller muscles, the tensor fascia latte. We have the sartorius, which also acts a little bit as a hip flexor. Okay. And a very important note, note here is that while these groin muscles are typically bucketed on the inside of the leg, they very much help assisting the hip flexors as well. So the adductor longus and the adductor, and sorry, the adductor longus and the pectineus, the position of them allows them to help with hip flexion, particularly when the leg is behind you. So if your leg is behind you, say in a switch leap or you're sprinting to pull that leg back through to land or pull that leg through back through to sprint, these groin muscles are actually very, very active. Okay. So I see all the time that people are doing a ton of hip flexor work and a ton of quad work, and they still have really stiff quote unquote hip flexors. They don't understand why the athlete can't open their hips or do a really good back leg or get their back leg up higher and not bend their knee. It's because their adductors are actually very, very stiff. So working on the high groin tissue is actually one of the best kind of keys here is that's how you can increase the back leg flexibility is, is getting your groin more flexible as well. Not only your hip flexor, not only your quad. And of course, working on, you know, strength and active flexibility for that back leg. So that's kind of the front here. Just a couple of things that I want to, again, just double down and really highlight. Um, the One of the attachments of the quad muscle I mentioned, the rectus femoris, does attach to the joint capsule. It dives down and reflects into the anterior capsule. So it can be something that irritates the hip joint as well. Uh, the iliopsoas, like I said, starts on the spine. Okay, And it also, that tendon that comes down across, which I can bring back up this slide, if you were to zoom in all the way here and you would look at where this tendon of this muscle crosses the psoas itself. The tendon does have a role to stabilize the front of the hip joint. So it goes really close to the femoral head and the femoral neck. And so that anterior hip flexor tendon can be a stabilizer against it. So that's why we want to one, make sure we're not overstretching the joint capsule, but two, we want to do some hip flexor strengthening type stuff to help use that as a dynamic stabilizer against that really end range of motion as well, right? You think about kicking the leg back behind you for a switch leap. You don't think about, okay, what's in the front we have to work on to protect that. Well, the hip flexor or the quad has to dynamically stabilize that stuff. That's again, going back to why I'm such a fan of active flexibility work, but also rear foot elevated split squats, split sliders, because we're slowly loading that motion and teaching the, the hip how to protect itself a little bit. All right. So let's go to the back. Now let's talk about some of the muscles in the back. A lot of the stuff people have talked about here and they understand, right? So the glute max is probably one of the biggest ones that's not shown here, but it's this big kind of like glute muscle. That's, that's kind of your butt that's on the back there. And that's a big muscle to help extend the hip and rotate the hip and land. It's very important to run and jump. It's a huge power producer. The uh, hamstring tendons uh, themselves start just below that. And they, they actually are composed of two muscles. The semimembranosus and the semitendinosus are on one side. And then we have the biceps femoris. And then again, uh, along with the adductors and the groin, which we'll cover soon. Um, the adductor magnus is super, super important to work with the hip extensors as well. It's particularly with deep squatting. So when you squat down really low and you come up out of the hole, um, that essentially is the first 25 to 50% is, is a lot of adductor magnus work. And then the glutes take over and the hamstrings help out. But keep in mind, again, when that front leg is in front of you, when your leg is really far in front, of you want to switch sleep, pulling that leg back down, the adductor magnus is very, very active. Okay. And it's a lot of times why girls will get um, strains and, and hamstring strains is because that very extreme range of motion puts a ton of stress on the hamstring and it puts a ton of stress on the uh, groin, the adductor magnus. And if we're not doing strength and conditioning to load these muscles and get them stronger and more mobile and eccentric training to prepare them at end range, right? This is why people might have high hamstring growth plate irritations because it's just too much workload and the extreme range of motion they're not prepared for yet. And it could be that maybe this muscle is underdeveloped. We're not doing enough groin strength, direct loading of the groin, the hamstrings to keep up with the sport of gymnastics. Gymnastics is really good at doing a lot of hip flexors, a lot of leg lifts, a lot of quads, a lot of squats, but gymnastics is very, very bad at doing deadlifts and weighted hip lifts and groin work, Copenhagen planks, um, side plank clamshell work, really intense, heavy work to get enough to balance out the other ones. So have to really keep that in mind. 
Okay, and just a few notes on this one as well. Okay, the common hamstring tendon is where the growth plate is. So those big, big muscles come up, they attach right to the growth plate, which is right up here. I'll zoom in. Okay, so right here is we is where the growth plate would be. So you see these giant muscles come all the way up and they attach to this growth plate. You could probably see why it's easy for someone to get a hamstring irritation if they're a young athlete and their growth plate is open. That's going to kind of be the, the weak link in the chain, so to speak, until they, they go through puberty. So that's one thing to think about, right? Two, there's just an enormous force on, on the hamstring and on the, the high hip, hip bone, um, with running and sprinting and jumping. So in the back of the leg, the hamstring, the glute, stuff like that, they take an enormous amount of force in gymnastics with running, sprinting, landing jumps and leaps, active flexibility, switch sides as we'll talk about with like, um, you know, the groin muscle straddle split, stuff like that, or enormous amounts of force on the hip joint. So there's always this kind of tug of war that we have going on between the front and the back, right? We have a tug of war between the glutes and the hip flexors and the quads. So the hamstrings and the glutes, we also have a tug of war between the, the inside groin muscle and the outside muscle. So the, the adductors and the, and the outer glutes to kind of keep that balance. We also have a, a tug of war between the motion of, of turning your hip in and kind of turning your hip out. So internal and external rotation, there are no direct internal rotators of the hip, like the shoulder, but there are a lot of muscles that contribute to it. And, um, we have a lot of muscles that externally rotate the hip because that's a really important. So there's always this tug of war between front to back, side to side, in to out. And we have to train these all equally if we want really, really good hip performance and really, really good hip, hip health. Okay. And then, uh, we've talked about a couple of these already, but these are the groin muscles. So you can kind of see them here. So we have the adductor brevis, the adductor longus, the magnus, right? We talked about how the brevis and the longus do have a role in the hip flexion and that the magnus has a role in hip extension, but keep in mind the main goal and the main function of the, of the adductors is very much bringing the legs together. So it bringing the legs together, but also stabilizing, especially on one leg. So all these muscles on the inside of the groin, they work to push the leg front to back and assistance with the other things we just covered, but they also pull the legs together and they also really stabilize on one leg, which obviously we know that's really, really important for gymnastics. So we do want to train these muscles. We want to make sure they're definitely taken care of in gymnastics in particular gymnastics, you know, has athletes squeezing their legs together for a living for good form. So it's very, very common for these to get overworked and under underused or sorry, under attention. So lots of flexibility work, lots of strength work for the quad, the hip flexor, the glutes, the hamstrings, but completely neglecting the groin, completely neglecting the inside of the hip. And a lot of times you can have groin pulls, but also you can have athletes who are very, very imbalanced between how strong their groin is and how strong the outside of their hip joint is. And that can put quite a bit of stress on the hip joint itself and cause some irritation. So we really want to make sure that not only are we, we on top of flexibility, we're on top of like eccentric strength work, because that's exactly what's going on with gymnastics. Okay. I'm not going to go through and kind of repeat the things I just said about the, um, adductors kind of rolls front to back, but just really keep in mind that the adductors are very, very important to synergize with the, the front and the back of the hip joint and with the core. Okay. The core has, uh, your, your stomach muscles, some of your stomach muscles attach really close to where your groin muscles also attach. So sometimes you can have things like inguinal uh, pain or, you know, sports hernia or stuff like that. And a lot of this time, I think it comes down to just really good physical preparation and really, really good workload programs to make sure we're not overloading this area. Okay. And then very, very important as well, uh, kind of rounding up the next layer is that the outside of the hip joint has some very, very important muscles that are crucial for jumps, leaps, sprinting, landing in bars, right? These muscles that literally rotate the hips through do that swim through motion or do that kind of pulling and pushing motion and jumps and leaps. I think oftentimes we really under train them quite a bit in gymnastics, right? So we have the glute medius and the glute minimus right, which are on the outside of the, the hip joint here. So one, they bring the leg out to the side, right, for a straddle jump, but they also are pretty much the main stabilizer of landing on one leg. So if you don't want to fall off beam, right, you need to have a very, very strong outer hip muscles. But sometimes when you land on one leg, if you're not strong enough, the hip can drop down and you can actually cause some pinching of the groin in this kind of compression of these two bones together. So it's very important for gymnasts to have very, very strong outer hip muscles to perform well, to, to sprint, right? Sprinting on one leg requires an enormous amount of outer hip strength to kind of balance that, that side to side motion as you're trying to run straight ahead. If you have really not developed outer hips, it's really hard for your hamstrings and your quads and your glutes to make you run really, really fast. So I've seen some athletes that have enormously strong quads, glutes, hamstrings, but they don't have any strength on the outside of the leg. And they kind of wobble back and forth when they run, they can't produce the power they need for their really, really good vault sprints. So we have these glute medius and the glute minimus. We also have some really important deep hip, hip rotator muscles. So piriformis, the, uh, the gemelli, the obturators, these are, are essentially called like the hip rotator cuff. So in the shoulder, we have these smaller muscles that help keep the ball in the socket. In our hip joint, we have very small muscles that are also very, very important to kind of keep that, that hip nice and snug inside. So 
these are all the ones on the outside of the hip. Again, super important to work, super, super, uh, you know, underlooked. I think sometimes in gymnastics, we don't do exercises. We, sometimes we don't do exercises at all for them. But if we are doing exercises for them, I think we're not really doing them in a, in a degree or a, an intensity that they they demand uh, to get stronger, right? We're really good at doing tons of squats and tons of leg lifts and tons of different calf raises, but doing the right amount of exercises at the right intensity for these uh, outer hip muscles is sometimes neglected. And I think it's a lot of times what I'm doing with, with rehab is trying to help athletes balance these things out a little bit. So we want to make sure that there is uh, always attention here. I really do have to mention before we move on to layer four is that there is so much more than this, particularly in the pelvic floor. Uh, you know, I am not a women's health expert and I always refer out to people who are, but the pelvic floor in, in male and female athletes is enormously important and is oftentimes very, very overlooked, but it's an entire specialty on its own. It's very complex. It's obviously something very, very sensitive to male and female athletes, particularly that are young. So if there are any issues with like stress incontinence or leakage when they tumble um, or having issues related to like high groin pain, that's a little bit less about a hip joint. It's more about the pelvic floor. I pretty much always refer those people out because it is very, very important. And it's so important that I know it has to have a special specialty attention. So I want to just kind of highlight that it's very important to mention, but it's really not my expertise. And so I'm not going to really cover it in this, uh, this podcast. All right. So that's layer three. Just to recap, we had the bones as layer one, the joint capsules and the ligaments is layer two. And then the actual uh, hip muscles themselves is layer three. Layer four is typically not related to injuries as much, but it is sometimes a thing to mention. It's really more about the nerves and the blood vessels, right? So we have nerves that go down to the front of the hip, the femoral nerve, the outside and the back is the sciatica nerve, which many people know. Oftentimes you can have irritation of the sciatic nerve alongside a hamstring issue or irritation of the femoral nerve alongside of a groin or a hip flexor strain. So I don't think people are going to be, you know, diagnosing and going in depth into femoral nerve, you know, neuritis and stuff like that. But it is worth mentioning that the, the L4, L5 kind of goes down to that sacral region, blends back. The femoral nerve, L2, L3, L4 is kind of in the front and the groin. And then the obturator nerve is L2, L3, and L4 kind of has fibers passing through the psoas major and kind of coming out the inside as well. So that's there. And then of course there are very big blood vessels. There's the femoral, uh, femoral blood vessel, femoral vessel, um, femoral artery, I should say is more specific. Femoral artery is inside there. We have very large, uh, you know, blood vessels throughout the entire hip. But again, in terms of what gymnasts commonly deal with for injuries, they're much, much more rare and they're much more, um, you know, not common things that we see. So lastly, as opposed to that, is that yes, there's extremely important things in layer five, which is the spinal mechanics. So kinetic chain refers to things above and below. So the back and the, the hip joint is really one and the same, right? Like you can't treat the lower back without treating the hip and vice versa. So when you over arch, right, or extend your back, it actually drives motion inward. So internal rotation of the hip is driven by this anterior pelvic tilt versus posterior pelvic tilt is kind of driven by external rotation and getting more space and clearance. And the reason I bring this up is because many gymnasts have an overarched posture. So if you have an overarched posture and you're landing in that position or you're running in that position, it predisposes a lot more possible irritation of the front and the inside of your groin, because you might be kind of compressing those bones together, the, the socket and the ball and the femoral neck could be squishing onto each other. That's called FAI. So oftentimes you can have this kind of FAI and you also sometimes can overstress your hamstring. If you're really anteriorly pelvic tilted, it can put a ton of predisposed stress on the growth plate and on the hamstring muscle itself. So I actually have seen a lot of gymnasts who have chronic hamstring problems who are doing all the right exercises, but they actually have never fixed their anterior pelvic tilt or their posture because maybe their groin is very stiff, their adductors are stiff, their hip flexors are stiff. They don't know how to run and, and sprint in a way that keeps their pelvis slightly tucked under. So they keep straining their hamstring with jumps and with leaps and with running because they haven't fixed this kind of postural mechanic. So that's something just to mention is that it's really important to understand how uh, the arch or the, the hollowing of the pelvis drives some of these things. Okay. And then also we have to make sure that we're thinking about not as, you know, not as super common, but the, the ankle flexibility is super important here too. So if someone has really stiff ankles, it's going to be challenging to squat to full depth. And it might be really, really challenging for someone to land properly. So not always, you know, the, the biggest thing I've found, but if someone does have really, really tight ankles, they're coming back from a hip injury. I want to make sure we teach them how to land properly. I'm going to teach them how to also work on their ankle mobility so that they don't have any problems down the road. So those are kind of the five layers of the hip. And I know we took a big, you know, detour there to kind of go into dork land, but I think it's really important for people to understand that. And so with that in mind with anatomy, now we can talk about injuries because now we understand, okay, what are the, the anatomical pieces behind that? Okay. It makes sense now why somebody has a groin strain. It makes sense why somebody has a hamstring strain as we talked about, but we're going to go in a very similar way 
So I'm kind of going to go through, you know, the front of the hip joint, the back of the hip joint, the inside, the outside, just to kind of match that template to help people help people kind of wrap their head around a little bit. And I'll, and again, I'll use some of these um, these slides here to help up because I think the pictures are really really helpful. So let's talk about some injuries, okay? So for the hip joint itself, right? What are we going to think about? The most important one I think I want to talk about first is going to be like ligament strains and labral tears. Okay. So it's really a combination of all these factors together, which is going to be like the bone can be irritated. The ligament can be irritated the capsule. But the reason I bring it up first is because although it's not the most common, not everybody's labral tear, in my opinion, I think it's the most, um, hmm, it's the most misunderstood and it's the most glazed over, right? A lot of times you'll hear in gymnastics, like, oh, here's the hip flexor strain. Like, oh, she just strained her groin. Like she'll be okay. Over time, these things can be really serious. And this picture is actually from a former student of mine who was a collegiate gymnast. This is her hip joint. She had a huge labral tear from years of gymnastics and doing really inappropriate flexibility methods and getting pushed on and splits and kind of going way too hard and not having strength conditioning behind her. Um, she has some really big hip issues. She's had four hip surgeries since graduating from college, which is crazy, right? So I don't think it's something that we need to go freak out and everyone has a labral tear, but we have to understand why these things happen, okay? So labral tears are going to be typically because of this combination of all these things, right? We have really high forces, right, on end range, and we have really, really extreme ranges of motion. So you take someone who's doing switch leaps all the time or is doing really intense flexibility work or really intense jumps and leaps over and over and over again, remember that the, the strain on this labrum comes in end ranges of flexing your hip up and rotating, or when you swing your leg behind you really, really hard, and do a lot of volume that way, that too can irritate the labrum. Okay. So in this situation, the hip micro instability might come from overuse. It might come from having really, really stiff groin and stiff quad and stiff hip flexor plus hypermobile joint capsules, as we talked about. It might come from poor flexibility methods. Maybe someone doesn't have enough glute and outer hip rotator strength to keep up with these high forces. Maybe all these things together is going to slowly just put some pressure on the labrum over and over and over to the point where it starts to, again, have some irritation. Maybe it just stays there. It just gets cranky and the joint gets sore and you feel some groin pain for a while. If it keeps going on, the labrum itself can tear. And that obviously can cause some really huge issues with that suction seal, which then further propagates, unfortunately, more irritation and more instability. Okay. The other thing I want to talk about here is a lot of the times we have what's called a fulcrum mechanism. So again, think about, and I can show you this picture that I, this sweet stick figure that I drew to help illustrate this. When someone swings their leg up to end range in the back, remember again, there's more bony coverage in the back of the hip joint than the front. So what happens is that the leg bone itself can make contact with the top and it can cause the, the neck of the femur and the head of the femur to slide forward out the front of the joint. And again, remember what's on the front of the hip joint here, the labrum, the hip flexor, the quad, right? These muscles, the ligament, the iliofemoral ligament, these structures can all become very, very irritated. I've seen a lot of times where someone has chronic hip flexor strains, but the problem is more the jumping and the leaping, the over splits, and that maybe using ankle weights, unfortunately, which again, short stories, I'm not a fan of for these reasons, right? Ankle weights put a ton of pressure on your hip joint. Um, and for this, I think this is a common mechanism I see, which is a lot of things behind the body with this back leg can cause the front of the hip joint to become irritated. So what happens here is that this, this bony contact essentially makes contact. So I'm going to zoom my screen out just to make this point really well known. I'll put this back up. I promise. So when your hip joint looks like this, if you're standing, right, and this is the coverage, when you swing your leg backward, you can see how this this is really your femur, this, this contact happens and it causes tipping out the front. So that tipping out the front, that fulcrum mechanism is what micro instability of the hip is thought to be. If I'm doing it the sideways way, I'm doing a straddle split. So I'm here, if I straddle my leg up to end range and I hit that side of my acetabulum of that wall, it can cause the tipping downward, right? So the groin pain could happen this way. The front motion, it doesn't happen as often because there's more space in the front of the hip joint to flex your leg up really, really far. But this is a really common mechanism for label irritation, for micro instability, for label tears, and just, just generalized joint crankiness in gymnasts is this combination of really extreme motion. Maybe my soft tissue flexibility is not all there. I have really hypermobile joints and the workload is way too high and it's putting pressure on the front of my joint. Not to mention if I have open growth plates as a young kid, I could be straining my hip flexor and my growth plate as well. Okay. So that's capsule label strains. That's definitely something that's more and more common. Okay. That, that 
comp compression mechanism is going to be if you're landing and your hips are rotating in and that can squish the labrum itself, right? There would be some tests that we do. I'm not going to go all the way down the hole, but you could do a fader test. You could do some sort of dynamic impingement test as well to test for that kind of compression mechanism. But the other way back behind you mechanism, the way you test for that is you do anterior glide testing. So you put someone on their side and you push the hip into this position of my, my hand is pulling back on this side and I'm pushing her hip forward to mimic that anterior sliding, right? You can do that's an anterior apprehension test. You can also do, um, so that's a sideline hyperextension test. You can also do an anterior apprehension test, which is where you can put someone in a Thomas test position, push their leg down and kind of the table fulcrums up and it mimics that again, forward sliding motion. You can put someone on their stomach and you can put them in a figure four and do an anterior glide and just see if those kind of overload motions irritate that. All right. So in the front of the hip joint, the next one we can also talk about is going to be the AIIS, which is essentially where the, the quad muscle attaches to. There's a growth plate there as well. So you can either have some, you know, kicking your leg so hard, you can compress that. And that's called subspine impingement, which is this slide, right? So kicking your leg all the way up and compressing that AIIS can be subspine impingement that can squish the hip flexor, cause pain in the front of the hip joint. It can also uh, be the other way, whereas you can have some over uh, overuse type stuff on the rectus femoris and have a growth plate irritation of the the, the front of your hip joint, right? The pain on that, it's like a, the, the big bone you can feel on the front of your hip just below that is the little bone. That's where this, uh, that quad muscle attaches to. So sometimes with running and with sprinting, um, athletes will complain of that kind of when their back leg is behind them. Okay. Or if they kick their like really high up in the front, usually rhythmic, uh, uh, rhythmic gymnasts and dancers and ballet dancers get this more so, but essentially that uncontrolled, very aggressive kick in the front that can cause some of the irritation as well. Okay. So how would you test for this, right? For the, the subspine impingement, you would just do end range hip flexion and push. Um, you would palpate that part on the bone. You could get an MRI to also look and see if there's growth plate irritation or inflammation and x-ray as well. Um, and you could do some, uh, quad testing as well. So like straight leg raise testing to see if that activation of the quad muscle, uh, or the hip flexor causes that irritation around that side. Okay. So let's look now as well onto another growth plate issue, which is the, uh, the hip flexor. So the hip flexor attaches down to one of the, the growth plates area on the, um, the lesser trochanter it's called. So that's where it attaches. So essentially there's a growth plate there as well. And that the repetitive hip flexion could cause, um, the growth plate to become irritated. So usually the first one I mentioned, the growth plate is with running and with sprinting. This one is typically with flexing your legs up. So kips, leg lifts, um, hip flexing, all that kind of stuff. You can have a irritation of the growth plate or over time, they're unable to really tolerate that, right? How would you test for that? It's kind of the same kind of deal. You would do a hip flexor strength test to see if it gets sore. You could do some eccentric split tests uh, with like a split squat, and then you would look at an x-ray, you would look at an MRI. All right. Uh, next thing on the front of the joint, and I know I'm kind of just glazing over them. I don't want to have an entire dissertation here, but essentially stress fractures, right? So stress fractures are uh, unfortunate. They are very, very uh, important to deal with sometimes. So you can have uh, stress fractures, which are either tension sided, tension sided or compression sided, right? If somebody has uh, a tension sided stress fracture, you want to definitely make sure somebody is getting to the uh, x-ray right away because it can be very, very concerning, right? So you want to make sure that someone is going to have imaging when they have possible, but these are like not so specific, right? That these dull, icky, they come on with, um, you know, high workloads, they kind of come back, stuff like that. Tension sided is a little bit more emergent, whereas a compression sided is not as, oh my God. But essentially, you're trying to just look at look and rule out if someone's pain is getting better in a couple of weeks, it's probably more muscular. If someone's pain lasts for more than four to six weeks, um, it keeps coming back. They repetitively have hip pain. They can't really land well. They can't run well. It's this deep, achy, ugh, feels terrible. The whole thing's sore. Um, you might want to rule out a stress fracture in someone who's younger just because of how much volume goes on. Um, and so essentially it's a, it's a diagnostic of exclusion. If you have things just not going well and it's not getting better, but there's also some things to think about too, which is like repetitive, um, you know, impact, repetitive traction, Sometimes there's some bone mineral density and or red S syndrome or nutritional things. We have to think about if someone keeps having stress fractures over and over again, right? The way we rule these out, like I said, is by doing a subjective history, talking about their training, talking about how many times they've had the pain. Is it hurt to weight bear? Is it hurt to jump and land on one leg? Does it hurt to do landing stuff? And then do you have any x-ray imaging or bone stress injuries to uh, kind of follow, sorry, bone scans to follow that up a little bit. All right. And then just a couple more here, just easily diagnosed, which are just strains. So, uh, muscular strains can happen in all ways, shapes and forms. So you can have a quad strain, which is just your sprinting in the middle of your quad, the higher your quad gets sore. Uh, it's pretty, you know, straightforward. They're sprinting, they're running, they feel their quad seize up. They feel like their high hip flexor uh, area also can seize up a little bit, but, um, just high eccentric stress of, uh, usually happens in soccer players and kicking, but it can happen in gymnasts as well. We can have a straight up, just hip flexor strain, right? One acute, uh, instance of I, I landed weird, I kicked weird, I did something, I kind of pulled my groin, or I pulled my hip flexor, 
that can cause some irritation as well. Okay. And you would test for these things with active strength tests, right? So you would test with a hip flexion test or a straight leg raise test. Um, passive range of motion will typically not bug these people, but doing active contraction of the muscles will. All right. And then you've probably heard of snapping hip syndrome too, which is the last one that we'll cover here. So snapping hip syndrome is essentially when certain tendons or, uh, structures are kind of rubbing back and forth over bones. So internal happening, snapping hip syndrome is the psoas tendon over one of the, the front of the margins of the, uh, the femur, the iliopectineal eminence. And then the external snapping hip is more on the outside. It's the outside of your hip joint. So your it band snapping over your greater trochanter, right? And so the joke here is that like internal snapping hip is something you can hear, whereas external snapping hip is something you can see. So, you know, that's, that's the joke. And, uh, Sometimes what happens is you have people who are doing like leg lifts, they're doing like leg lowers or like V-ups and they feel this popping and this snapping in the front of their hip joint. And they're like, oh my God, what's that, right? That's usually the tenant going back and forth. Honestly, sometimes if it doesn't hurt at all, it just happens and it is what it is. Mine used to do this all the time as a kid. Um, you can work on some flexibility, you can work on some strength, but sometimes it just is what it is because of the way your hips are designed or maybe you have to work on like not being so arched and no over, overly tilted. Um, but if it's not causing you a ton of pain, sometimes it just happens, comes and goes. If it causes pain, however, obviously that can be something that's more prominent, right? So it can cause them, if it rubs over enough, it can get inflamed and irritated. Same thing with the outside of your hip. On the outside, this IT band can snap back and forth on your greater trochanter. It too can cause some irritation. So if that happens, right, you can just make sure that you are doing some uh, testing to make sure you're ruling the right one. So you can look at the reproduction of uh, symptoms with a hip flexion to extension, kind of going back and forth in and out of that hip range. Um, you can also do some just hip rotation as well and see if it reproduces that snap. Nine times out of 10, the person you're talking with can just do it for you. Like, yeah, when I do this, it feels it. And it's like, you can kind of see it or hear it. So I just want to, um, before we move on to uh, the next thing with, uh, you know, groin issues is I want to just kind of highlight here how it starts to get into murky territories where the front of the hip joint and the inside of the hip joint become a little bit overlapping. So there is a ton of overlap between uh, tests and issues and pathologies in the front of the hip joint and the inside of the hip joint. In the same way, there's definitely a lot of carryover between the outside of the hip and the back of the hip joint. So the reason I put the front of the hip joint first, because it covers the most things as an umbrella. And now we'll kind of, we'll kind of skip through some of the overlapping symptoms if they happen both, right? It's very common to have you know, a, a hip joint irritation that hurts the front and the inside of your hip and not exclusively only the front. So particularly the first one that comes up here though, is like the same thing of labral tears and um, capsular labral strains or ligament strains. So when you do some of the special testing, for example, like a, a fader test or a Faber test or, you know, all sorts of things to look for a label tear, there's a lot of things that are diagnostic for that, right? There's some question around the sensitivity of some of these tests, like a moving Thomas test, for example, it's got some good diagnostic accuracy, but sometimes it's not really very clear and crystal cut to know what's going on. But on the inside of the hip joint, you can definitely have labral tears and labral irritations, right? So this is going to be someone who maybe instead of having the leg come behind them and have it tip out the front, this person might have more pain with the outside straddling motion where it tips downward. Like I said, that fulcrum mechanism, this could produce more of the undersided groin type pain of the medial type hip pain that could be definitely common. Um, but you're going to do the same kind of test. You would do a fader test. You would do a lateral wall impingement test, which essentially is when you're going to go bring the leg out to the side in a straddle and see if you straddle a flex someone's hip up so much to the side that it causes the outside of the hip joint to bump and it slides the hip joint down. If that produces groin symptoms, that could definitely be something going on. You could also do some single leg squats, some lateral lunges to see if maybe their, their label issue is more provoked or irritated with, um, sideways stepping instead of just, you know, front to back running or things like that. Okay. The other thing that's going to happen too, with there is going to be instability, right? So in the same way that when you slide your, when you kick your leg behind you and it slides the leg, the hip joint forward, when you kick your leg to the side, as I just said, it slides your hip joint down. So somebody can have not so much uh, labral irritation, but they can have some micro instability from that extreme end range of motion. I just said how the ballet dancers, you know, when they're in x-rays, they sublux their hips inferiorly to get that motion to kind of show up. Well, that can be the same thing here. What can happen is, and you can see this with this test, is that if I straddle and bring Jan's leg all the way up to the side, you can maybe hit the wall of the outside of the hip joint and slide downwards. This is a lateral overpressure test. And so you're looking maybe... Uh, we'll talk about in the lateral section, it can cause pain on the outside of your hip joint from the bony impingement. But in this situation, you're looking to see if that end range of motion of, of bringing the leg up to the side causes groin pain causes like, cause you're thinking that you're hitting the wall and tipping downward. Maybe it's a groin irritation from protective mechanism. Maybe it's actually the labrum itself. Maybe it's something related to uh, the outside of the hip joint is just getting beat up a little bit and causing that inside to slide. Um, but this is a very common thing that we see is sometimes the, the, the outside straddling motion is more the issue and not so much the front to back motion as well.
Okay. Probably the most common one you're going to see in gymnastics will just be a classic groin strain. So lots of like, you know, sprinting, jumping, switch sides, all that kind of stuff. Like I said, we have to remember that certain groin muscles are acting in assistance with the hip flexors or in assistance with the, the hamstrings. So they can also be prone to strains. So I think a lot of times I see someone who has like switch leaps or sprinting, they get a high groin strain and the adductor magnus that they think is a hamstring problem when in reality it's the groin or like i just talked about they do switch sides and the groin muscles get strained because they're actually working to snap the legs together too as well so you're going to see these show up quite a bit as like you know switch sides or eccentric loading sprinting running jumping if we're not being uh diligent to slowly add in active flexibility drills or slowly add in new workloads on like jumps and leaps and in bars in particular um, very common to have someone strain their groin and it takes like two to four weeks to calm down. So I'd highly cautious people to not just take a bunch of drills and throw them at someone in a flexibility circuit. I'd really be careful about that kind of stuff. Okay. The other thing we see it sometimes show up on two is going to be with like aerials. So, uh, side aerials in particular is someone can be on that base. leg, as you can see down here, this base leg is down and behind that puts quite a bit of stress on the groin itself. So when you're kicking in this front leg, this back leg groin could be getting irritated a little bit. So that's something to also keep in mind. So the way that we are going to um, test out the different types of adductor strains is based on what we know those things do. So with someone who has a hip flexion, oops, sorry, a hip flexion bias, right? Right? we're thinking about the, the adductor longest of the pectineus we'd want to see if when that leg is behind them so say like in a uh, the trail leg of a forward uh, lunge that could be something that is maybe more irritated by the the groin muscles in the back working as hip flexors so also we could see if somebody wants to have just a straight sideways uh, bias for the the inner adductor muscles when they do a lateral lunge that might bias just the straight inside and that could be you know showing for that groin strain versus if we're concerned somebody maybe has like an adductor magnus strain a deep deep squat or doing like a front kick or a lunge we would kind of provoke those symptoms in the back a little bit so you can kind of test out different strength right the front the inside of the back based on what things you think if you think it's an anterior adductor strain with switch leaps behind you could test out those if you think it's more of a, a side to side straddle or a switch side hip motion you could test those out and if you think it's more of a hip flexion based bias with the adductor magnus you could test that out as well with hip flexion okay so next we also have some symptoms related to the um, joint based snapping like i said uh, earlier, we, we talked about those uh, kind of popping and clicking things like that. But mechanical symptoms are a little bit different when we talk about the joint. So snapping hip syndrome, which I referred to is more like the, the tendon snapping in and out that's outside the joint. The groin based issues of like mechanical symptoms are very concerning because we're worried about a labral tear or we're worried about like possible loose bodies so if somebody has like if it pops it clicks it gets stuck um it hurts a lot when that happens when i pivot my leg back and forth you scratch your head a little bit about like okay let's let's try to see what's going on here with you know an imaging or an mri or an arthrogram where they put dye inside the hip we want to really make sure that the snapping that they feel or the popping they feel is 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 not related to labral tears or not related to, to interarticular loose bodies so if someone has mechanical symptoms they have like what we call a c sign which is pain in this they make a c or they really wrap it around their hip if they have a c sign pain they're popping they're clicking they're catching they're having trouble squatting they're having trouble doing rotational movements in and out you, know, you scratch your head a little bit and you want to do some diagnostic testing to rule out the snapping hip and maybe a groin strain versus a true uh, intraarticular pathology. And I have had a lot of cases where they think it's just a groin strain. They think it's just a sore adductor for a while, but in reality, it's, it's something more serious. So you want to keep those kind of uh, aha moments in mind. All right. So next let's go on to the uh, back of the uh, back of the hip, which is obviously going to be the biggest one everyone talks about. And this area is going to be the hamstring. So the hamstring can kind of be broken up into are you past puberty or are you before puberty so if you're before puberty it's going to be probably a growth pit irritation right the, the pain is going to be really high up in your buttock on your sit bone and again we talked about that growth plate is up there where all these giant hamstring muscles attach to so you're going to have what's called ischial apophysitis so ischia refers to the ischium that back of the sit bone okay the uh, apophysis is the growth plate and itis equals inflammation so this is inflammation of the high hamstring growth plate Okay, so ischiopophysitis is the formal dorky uh, word, but essentially what this is saying is that the hamstring stress is putting so much pressure on the on the growth plate that it's becoming inflamed. And also remember the sciatic nerve is right next door to the growth plate as well. So it's very, very painful, very, very painful, but it's also sometimes very, very, very frustrating because everything in gymnastics requires your hamstring to be stretched. So if you're before puberty, it's probably going to be an apophysitis. If you're after puberty, it then gets broken up into, okay, is your pain at the tendon way up in that uh, attachment point? Because now that your growth plate is closed, the tendon of the hamstring is probably taking the most irritation or 
is it more lower down in the hamstring belly, right? Is the soreness down in the middle of your thigh, which is more like a mid belly strain. So you can have growth plate issues in pre puberty after puberty. You can probably have hamstring tendon issues or different strains or grades of, of hamstring stuff on the bottom. So the reason that this, um, comes up for the growth plate irritation is again, rapid growth, right? Your leg bones, your femur bone in particular grow much, much faster than your hamstring can keep up with. And so it puts a lot of tension on the growth plate attachment because you're kind of pulling on it like a string, but also too much eccentric overload with jumps, with kicks, with sprinting, right? And maybe a spike in workload where we might throw a bunch of drills at someone or they come back from a vacation and jump in too fast, or maybe they're not doing enough physical preparation and staying on top of it. Those things are going to cause some irritation of that. And then after you get out of puberty, right? The same things would also cause maybe a, um, a hamstring strain or a hamstring tendinopathy. So, uh, strength and conditioning has definitely been shown to be a really, really good way to help out with this. So if you don't slowly prepare, say your high speed running or your jumps and leaps over the course of a couple of weeks, and you throw them all in at one time, it can cause an irritation in someone's uh, hamstring a little bit. So the way that we would test for this is we're going to do at apophysitis, right? We're going to test a passive straight leg raise all the way up, or maybe end range hip flexion. They're going to feel that tugging high up in their hip bone. You'll also know that someone's probably, you know, pre puberty and you'll get an x-ray that shows, you know, some irritation of the growth plate or an MRI. Okay. For someone who's got a, a tendon issue in their hamstring, you would do some high eccentric loading and you would have them run. You'd have them sprint you'd have them kick their legs and see if that bugs it a little bit. You could also do some active straight leg raises or some dynamic drills, um, skipping and things like that. Lunging, like step up lunging to see if that bugs the high hamstring. And you'd kind of rule in a little bit of the, uh, the hamstring as the issue. Okay. Very close next door to the hamstring and to the, the growth plate again is the sciatic nerve. And so I think this is less common, but sometimes very, very important to, to not miss is that if you have a nerve that goes from your lower back all the way down your back, of your leg and wraps around your foot and you're kicking your leg at a very uh, high frequency you can have a situation where the nerve itself becomes very, very irritated and causes some tingling or some pain down the back of your leg. So sometimes what I'll see in someone is it's not so much that their hamstring is not flexible. It's that the nerve is getting overly stretched when they kick, when they jump, when they run, when they sprint, when they step in for in bars, when they do in bar stallers, when they do jams or talks for guys, gymnastics. So this is a very different phenomenon, which they tend to get like tingling. They get pins and needles. Um, when they, when they stretch a pike stretch, they feel tingling in the back of their leg, which by the way, putting someone in a pike stretch and pulling your toes up into, into toes up flex position and leaning on them or pushing them down might be stretching their nerve more than their hamstring. So keep that in mind. Um, but essentially the nerve gets irritated because it is getting overly stretched. And so this is a little bit different of a test, which is instead of just doing a passive leg raise, which you can see here, I'm bringing Jan's leg up, right? And what I'm doing here is I'm not flexing her toe, right? A sciatic nerve tension test. I'm going to straighten this leg. I'm going to flex her toe up and I'm actually going to cross it across the midline towards me over here towards the camera. And I'm going to tug that sciatic nerve. I'm going to wrap it around the greater trochanter. If I get her to a point where she feels that nerve tension and then I let go of her foot and all of her symptoms go away, we have not changed the length of her hamstring. It's just made the nerve become less compressed. And so that's probably a, a, a rule in that it's more of a sciatic nerve thing and not so much as a, you know, um, sciatic, or sorry, not so much a hamstring issue or a growth plate issue. Okay. And it's worth noting right here that you can have lumbar referral here, right? So it's very important to know hamstring, you know, outer hip as well. Is this coming from the back or is this coming from the, the hip itself? And the way I do this is just a repeated motions test. If someone has a disc irritation, if you flex their spine a bunch, you can produce some symptoms in their sciatic nerve. If you extend them a bunch, probably take some symptoms away. So centralization versus peripheralization, you can understand, you know, who's doing that um, and what that mechanism is. You can also do a slump test. You could do a, uh, you know, compression test. Um, those things are going to change the back and cause irritation in the sciatic nerve. All right. All right. Last of the four, before we move on from the injury section, is just the outside, right? So um, the first thing I'll say is that the, the C sign I talked about can overlap sometimes here. So the C sign of joint referral sometimes can mimic or overlap with lateral wall impingement. So if somebody has a hip joint related issue, um, and the C sign, uh, symptoms show up more with like flexing and compressing, like your groin, if those symptoms get worse, as you do fader tests and stuff like that, you might be concerned it's intraarticular versus if someone's C sign is only produced with like a lateral wall impingement test, as we'll talk about, um, and we already have talked about like, that's a little bit different, right? That's outside the joint, right? The, the intraarticular labral tear C sign is inside the joint because the labrum is getting compressed by the femoral neck. The outside the joint is the two bones getting compressed. The lateral femoral neck is hitting the acetabular wall and it's causing a bone bruise. So that's what we see sometimes here is on the outside of the hip joint. Somebody can do a lot of kicks and jumps and straddles and, and active flexibility. 
and they can have an excessive overpressure on this lateral wall back to this picture again, right? Lateral wall impingement is if I'm bringing her leg up all the way, she can be having those two bones hit each other. And that can cause some irritation on the outside of the hip joint versus we use this test before to look at the underside of the groin being sore. This is more the outside of the hip joint. So lateral wall impingement is usually end range compression. It's usually also detected with a lateral lunge. It's also usually detected with some just palpating around the, uh, the iliac crest. They'll be sore there around where it kind of inserts. Okay. Also on the outside of the hip joint, which is something that used to be very, very popular, but is now not as popular in terms of diagnostic is going to be, um, bursitis. So trochanteric bursitis was thought to be more from repetitive compression and friction around the inflammation. There's like a, a, a bursa that kind of cushions between the bone of the hip joint and then the outside of the glute muscle. And they were thought that this uh, muscle contracting was rubbing against this bursa and it was causing some irritation, but newer research has shown through, you know, some diagnostic injections and also some imaging that maybe it's less about the bursa and it's more about the tendon of the glute med. Okay. So I have this in here as a, as kind of a, a filler slide for me to make sure I talk about it is yes, I, I do think trochanteric bursitis exists, but it's typically not in a gymnastics population. This isn't someone who's much, much older typically is very sedentary and maybe lays on their side a lot or doesn't have the best hip strength. Um, this is very different than the person that we see, which is a very active individual who is having a lot of um, work done on their outside of their hip. The glute med tendon attaches on the outside as well. So it's very commonly um, misdiagnosed as bursitis when it could be the glute med tendon. So glute med tendinopathy is probably going to be more of the issue, which is what I have here. Okay. So glute med and or deep hip external rotator strains, repetitive overuse, spikes in workloads, Back to my point about not doing enough uh, outside hip strength training for like the glutes, the sideband walks, lateral sled walks, single leg RDLs, um, really intense long plank work to get the side of the glute really, really strong. Um, those sometimes can be what predisposes a glute med tendinopathy or a, um, a hip joint uh, irritation because these muscles are maybe underworked. We throw them into the deep end of the water with all sorts of jumps and leaps and sprinting and in bars, and it strains the muscle the same way it could strain a groin that's not really prepared for it. So. I think it's important here to realize that you want to be training these just as much as you do the rest, right? If you do too much single leg uh, jumping and landing and the hip joint is tipping over, you can get that Trandellenburg sign or that hip drop sign that we see that can put a lot of strain on the glute mean as well. Okay. Uh, sometimes there is some lumbar referral that I will, you know, I already kind of chatted to before, but, um, yeah, so that is the, uh, injuries there. I know that again, that was a gauntlet. I apologize for going so well, but again, I want this to be all inclusive. I want this to be like, if somebody has an issue, they can come back and they can find something. We'll timestamp it all. Um, but now let's talk about, okay, what do we do about this? Okay. So now we're gonna talk about like, okay, someone has a pain, someone has an issue. What are we going to do to try to actually help someone here? And the way, the thing I always start with this is that you have to realize is that there is extremely, and I mean, extremely variable, um, timelines for injuries, right? Some hip injuries are very, very mild. They're very, very benign, the groin strain or a hip flexor strain. They might only take two weeks, right? They could literally get better in two weeks. If you just back off the things that bug them and they get better. Other things on the way extreme side, like a labral tear or some sort of like a surgery called the PAO, those are huge surgeries, like monstrous surgeries. It's going to be up to like nine months for a year to somebody to get back to that. So there's a huge, huge bandwidth there. And the other thing I really want to point out here is that you can never compare injuries, right? You can't say that one 10 year old, uh, hamstring growth plate irritation got better in six weeks or eight weeks. And so this other 10 year old with a hamstring growth, irritation, she should also get better in 10 weeks. Not true different rates of growth, different skill backgrounds, different injury histories. One could be a level six and one could be a level 10. Um, there's so much variability inside there that I really, I suggest that people do not just automatically overlap, you know, 10 years old with a hamstring is 10 years old with a hamstring. That's not how it works. Okay. It's a very large range of things. There's also so many factors. You, your sleep quality, are you properly fueling yourself? Are you taking the appropriate exercise progressions? Do you have great return to sport progressions? Like all these things are very, very important. So before I share with you kind of like my timelines that I think is important, I just want to highlight that because I don't want someone to get hung up on like, oh, Dave said two weeks or Dave said five weeks or something like that. Okay. But generally, there are four phases to every injury and particularly with hips that I go people through. So phase one is the acute phase, right? Or kind of putting the fire out, quote unquote. Phase two is the, uh, is the intermediate phase, which I say is just being a normal human again. So can you walk? Can you drive? Can you sit? Okay. Number three is going to be being a general athlete again. So can you jump? Can you run? Can you sprint? Can you lift weights? Can you do basics? Um, and then four is going to be, be a gymnast again. That's the, that the return to sport phase. So this is kind of what I suggest is the best thing to do with these hip injuries. They're not going to be very specific. I'm not going to go injury by injury to every single treatment exercise. I'm just going to give you generally what I do, because again, we'd be here for about eight years. 
Um, but essentially in the first phase, this acute phase, you're trying to just calm things down, just put the fire out, right? You're trying to reduce the amount of irritation and inflammation that person has or the amount of pain they have. Okay. And sometimes the answers that people need to hear are not the ones they want to hear, but it's the only way to kind of get through this. Okay. So number one, you have to reduce the amount of workload on the hip, right? If hip flexion really hurts and you're still doing kips and you're still running and you're still doing jumps and you're still doing active flexibility, it's not going to calm down, right? Like a growth plate needs four to six weeks to calm down if it has true inflammation, right? A hamstring uh, strain needs a couple of weeks backed off of high intensity kicking or jumping or running to feel better. So if we want to see actual progress, we're going to have to reduce the workload itself. Now, that being said, gymnastics is fantastic, but there is a ton of stuff you can still do. I've made very elaborate, comprehensive programs for someone who has a hip flexor strain or has a hamstring strain with tons of things they can do with their core, with their arms, with their prehab, with their dance, with their choreography around their hip as well. So I don't want to say you can't do anything. I think it's actually a really good thing for someone to get in the gym and be with their friends and mentally, you know, be in the right place. Um, but we just got to be really careful about not overloading it too much. You're probably going to need a couple weeks to back off to make sure things feel better. So yes, back off, but also maintain their global activity levels. Can you put your leg up on a uh, stool and use your arms and your other leg to do a bike, bike sprinting interval? Can you sit down uh, and do rope slams? Can you do um, arm routines? Can you do bar drills with a spot? Can you do strap bar and metal bar? There's a lot of things you can do uh, if your hip is not, you know, able to kind of swing with it. But that you can also do lots of things to build around that in a, in a strength program or in a, a physical therapy program, right? There's lots of stuff for your shoulders, lots of stuff for your core that in the end are going to help you get back faster, but they're also going to maintain your sanity while you're there. So back off on the hip specific workloads, but find lots of things that you can do closely aligned with that. I think sometimes we under educate athletes on what things in their daily life are probably causing them pain, right? So sitting in a really deep chair or sitting in a really deep couch or crossing your legs or laying on your side, if you're tired, like you have to understand what things in their daily life are also going to irritate their hip. Because if they don't know that, nothing you give them in the hour of treatment is going to balance out the other 15, 18 hours of their putting stress on their hip. So a lot of times I'm teaching someone like, Oh, if your groin bugs you, you have to kind of bring a, a you know, a, a, um, a couch cushion and just toss it in the car and sit on an elevated surface, right? If you can, in the back of school, get up and walk around for five minutes, tell your teacher, Hey, my hips bugging me. I have an injury. Can I sit in the back and stand for five minutes every half hour or something like that? Don't make it a big deal. Don't run around, you know, do laps, but essentially just stand up and get your hip into a different position. Okay. So lots of things in their daily life have to be really importantly dealt with. It's really important. Like I said, that we're always treating the core and the hip together. So you should try to maintain as much possible core activity as you can. So uh, if it's not painful and if it's appropriate, dead bugs, bird dogs, side planks, anti-rotation press outs, um, farmer carries, sled work. You can probably find a lot of things that they can still do to keep the core muscles firing because when you get back to the actual training, it's going to be really, really key that those things show up. Okay. This is also a time to really address things above and below. So deal with any issues you have in the ankles or the thoracic spine that might be predisposing hip issues as well. Okay. So put those together now specifically for the hip. What do you do? Right. I'm people are like, all right, cool. Like what do you do for treatment? Right. So I'm very, very, uh, happy to do manual therapy and soft tissue work. So whether it's cupping tools, dry needling, whatever helps. I think that sometimes with overactive and very, uh, painful, like groin muscles in particular, or hamstring muscles, there's a really good benefit to a short dosage of manual therapy. The majority of my work though, is really around exercise. So after we back off in this acute phase for a hamstring, for example, I'm trying to find what is the lowest level of exercise they can tolerate. Sorry, the highest level of exercise they can tolerate without flaring up their pain. Can they do bridge marches? Can they do high hamstring holds? Can they do split squats? Can they do step ups? Can we modify the, the, the range of motion to do a low box step up instead of a high, high box step up? I'm trying to quickly find what is the exercise we can do. Sometimes someone had a surgery, it's really just passive range of motion, right? It's really just passive range of motion, um, very low level isometrics, um, stim assisted stuff, or doing BFR is really, really great right here as well, blood flow restriction training. I'm just doing anything I possibly can. If I can get someone to have BFR on, do some knee extension, some hamstring curls that are pain-free, bike with one leg up or in their arms and their leg and just get a global training effect or bike with the seat height really high, that's a huge win for me, right? Sometimes the, the entire treatment session is literally just um, soft tissue work, um, doing some manual therapy, passive range of motion, BFR with stim to do quads, hamstrings, ride the bike, call it 30 minutes, right? It's not super elaborate. It's not super extensive. It's just that quick little dose. But a lot of these times in the first like four to six weeks in particular, 
of this phase is just calming things down. And that's what I meant when I said they take range. It's about two to six weeks for me, kind of for each phase, depending on the, the obviously the injury. So two to six weeks for the first, second, third, and fourth phase. If you have an injury that's kind of, you know, low level, not too bad, it could be six to eight weeks through to get through all phases. If someone has a huge surgery, it might take six weeks for each of these things. You're looking at six months or something like that, or up to four months. So yeah, all these go together, but acute phase is education. Try to maintain the core function, soft tissue work, passive range of motion, um, lots of exercise uh, that they can tolerate. And essentially, I just I just try to calm them down for those first four weeks. Sometimes I don't see them super often if they just need time. Okay, But once they get out of that irritated phase, whether you're doing hands-on work, whether you're doing passive range of motion, whether you're educating them to not use their hip too much, it's just natural timeline of healing. The second phase is typically, again, be a human again. So what I'm doing here is I'm first progressing the exercises. I'm trying to get someone into all the exercises that I want for the glutes, for the hamstrings, for the quads. So side um, clamshells, side leg lifts, side band walks. Um, usually with most injuries, we're not doing direct hip flexor strengthening yet because doctors are nervous about loading that. Um, but if we can do some groin work, some straight leg raises and in the other direction, that's great. Um, mini squats, uh, mini split squats. We're just trying to do all the things we possibly can riding the bike with BFR. We would use BFR for a lot of these athletes, uh, when they're going through this phase, but essentially our goal is just to make a two day program that has a majority of the stuff they're doing. Okay. If we can, towards the end of this phase, if I can get them into a full program, that's like a squat, a hinge, a split squat, and really build that out, I will. So I try to get to split squats, maybe with two air X pads. I try to get the low box step ups. I try to get to some sort of a modified squat or some sort of a um, goblet squat to a box, just with low depth, um, some sort of hinging. So maybe a, a glute bridge or a single leg glute bridge with weight. Um, if they can kettlebell deadlift, we would do that as well. All these things are probably really, really good if we can get them to do them safely. And I'm also building in all the extra grunt work I can possibly do. So, uh, balancing on one leg, uh, single leg RDLs, um, forward sleds, backward sleds, lateral sleds, um, all sorts of, um, lateral band walks, core work, all that stuff is going in planks, front planks, side planks. I'm trying to build the, the most comprehensive exercise program that I can possibly do. That's really the biggest, the biggest rock in this phase. Okay. Number three is sorry. Number, number two in phase two is going to be restore passive hip range of motion. So they might've done a little bit of range of motion, but I'm trying to restore all of their range of motion. I'm trying to make sure they have full hip flexion, ER, uh, IR, if it's, it's, if it's needed, not everyone needs that, um, abduction, hip extension. I'm really trying to get soft tissue flexibility going well. So foam rolling, stretching, eccentrics, uh, the soft tissue work, regular passive range of motion, daily stretching at home. All that stuff is going in here because I really want that baseline of that strength. And I want that baseline of that flexibility to kind of be there. We're going to build in any core changes we've done, maybe understanding anterior, posterior pelvic tilt, understanding how to get yourself into a nice neutral brace. We're going to do this in this phase as well. And we're going to load it, right? Like I said, clearly a lot of exercise is what I go for. We will do some manual therapy, some passive range of motion, but almost all of my time is on a good two day uh, program. So again, squatting, hinging, split squats, um, balance, um, proprioception work, lateral band work, sled works, all that stuff is really the majority of it. But we just hammer away at that with basic linear loading for six weeks. We just slowly build somebody up over time until the three month mark where they can actually do a full comprehensive program. Some people that are really fast will go through these phases quick. Some people that are really not as uh, able to because their injury is more severe, we might just be hanging on low level BFR stuff for a couple more weeks or a modified range of motion or modified weight for as long as we can until we get clearance until we get to the third phase. So second phase is really all about exercise, restoring passive range of motion, and then getting their daily life to be okay. Can they walk up and down the stairs? Can they drive? Can they sit in school? Can they feel comfortable sleeping at night? I want all those things to be good before we go into an actual, you know, sports performance program. So, and that is phase three, right? So maybe now we're somewhere between the eight to 12 week mark. Someone's pain is almost gone or minimal. They have very low restrictions, no precautions. Baseline strength is good. Baseline flexibility is good. Baseline passive range of motion is good. Or it's at a point where we feel though it's, it's, it's good for them and what they need. So the advanced phase, which is just being an athlete again, is really all about advanced strength conditioning getting back to jumping and getting back to power work. Okay. That's for me, what I think is more important. So when I say advanced hip and leg strength work, I'm talking about real weight. I'm talking about load on their step-ups, load on their split squats, load on their deadlifts, load on their, um, their actual squats, stuff like that. I want it to be challenging. I want them to be sore, but, but not painful. So we're just making all these things much harder. We might change the, the load on squatting. We might change the, um, deadlift weight to go up a little bit more. We might change the range of motion on split squats. Like I said, to do front foot or rear foot elevated split squats. We might do uh, four days instead of two days in their program. So maybe they have a full, full four day strength program. Now I'm trying to make it hard. I'm trying to really prepare them for, for what their hips going to need to go through when they go back to gymnastics. So I also think right now it's really a good time to work on like some med ball work to slowly introduce power work. So med ball slams, med ball throws, med ball wall throws, 
for, uh, you know, not so much rotational throws, baseball players, maybe yes, but not gymnasts as much, but I'm doing a lot of these things because slamming and throwing are a really good way to express hip power without too much overload. Okay. We are also going to slowly progress some of the jumping and the running here. So running, running and jumping, I usually always start the same progression, whether it's a knee and ankle or hip injury, which is uh, pogo hops, in and out hops, scissor hops, jogging down and back, skipping down and back, karaoke. That's like my introduction point. Once the doctor clears them from like a surgery or we feel as though they're going well, you can do some partially modified things like um, band assisted pogo hops or running on a treadmill with your hands there to keep 50% of your weight. We don't have a G, an altered G or some sort of underwater treadmill. So running with your hands to take off 50% of your body weight. We could do those two as well if we think that's more important. Someone's really having a tough time from surgery. Um, but I really like that. I like pogo hops. I like scissor hops. I like jogging. Um, usually two days per week with 24 hours in between. I also really like doing some like basic hurdle hop progression. So small hurdle, jump and stick forward, sideways, sideways with two legs, progressing to single leg, progressing to maybe repeated bounding over hurdles, um, increasing the height of the hurdle. I really think those are super useful as well. We do a ton of box jumps. So 12 inch box jump up, step drop down. That helps with force explosion and acceptance. Those are really great as well. So that's really what we're doing is I'm trying to get back their advanced strength conditioning. I'm trying to get their, their running and their jumping back with again, um, the pogo scissors in and outs for a couple of weeks. Then maybe we do like some cone sprints Then maybe we do some change of direction drills. Maybe we have some, uh, reactive cone, I'm um, yelling uh, where to go, what color to get to that helps the running progression. Eventually till we get back to sprinting progressions, um, just doing, you know, 10 sprints with a, a minute in between or something like that at home. And then we're also getting back to the power of the jumping and the landing. So med ball sl throws, med ball slams, box jumps, side to side box jumps, line hops, broad jumps, band assisted broad jumps. I kind of have those three big buckets, really advanced strength running, and then plyometrics and power. That's kind of all the three buckets I'm getting to in this stage. And once you do that for about six weeks, right, you just build that program, you progress all these things. Logically, you want to progress things slowly, right? Double leg to single leg, low hurdles to high hurdles, uh, small boxes to high boxes, uh, small depth drops to higher depth drops, low speed running to high speed running. The natural progression you would use here after that you can then talk to them about, okay, what do we need for gymnastics specific stuff? So once that goes well, we know they have to get back to kicks, active flexibility, jumps, all sorts of very unique things. So I'll start sprinkling in some of these gymnastics things at the end of this phase as well. So split sliders are very, very good for front and side to get their splits back, um, active flexibility. So on their back, doing some nice, easy kicks, then you can add a TheraBand to them and do some faster kicks. Then you can break out some standing kicks. You can maybe get them on a tumble track of the gym, just jumping up and down and doing some very light kicks to prepare for the return to sport program. I'm slowly adding in these things like a couple days per week to really make sure they're going to be prepared for the return to sport program. Okay. So this is usually around like the, the four and a half month is usually where most of these fall. And again, it could be way shorter or way longer based on it, right? From a, a strain to a, a cartilage injury or a PIO is very, very different type of surgery. But lastly, Essentially, it's, let's just be a gymnast again, right? It's slowly build your return to sport program. I've taken these from the baseball world of how they did them. And I have created my own version that I think is really, really successful. So when we build this return to sport phase, right, we're going to try to make sure that we have a nice slow dosage of gymnastic specific surfaces and skills. The three things we're going to modify and use as our variables will be the surface that they're on. Okay. So tumble track versus rod strip versus floor, the amount of force that is going through their hip per skill. So basics on bars versus, you know, uh, swinging on bars versus uh, kipping on bars versus stallers and in bars have a very linear increase in force based on drills to higher skills. And then also repetitions, which is kind of the easiest one, which is how many are you doing per day, per week, per, per month? So we're going to start with three days per week, usually, right? I'm usually going to build in their home program into these events so that they're not doing every event every day. In the first two weeks, we're going to start with softer surfaces only. So drills, tumble track, um, very, very easy uh, surfaces for their hip. And we're going to do very, very basic skills. So drills, like I said, in low repetition. So I can't give you an exact number, but it's generally between like three to five of each skill that I try to start with. And we're doing this every other day. So that might be on tumble track for a little bit. It might be doing some basics on tumble track, some basics on bars, some basic cartwheel step-ins, jumping on the trampoline. We would do that every other day for two weeks and make sure no symptoms increase. Because in my experience, the, the symptoms are typically not during their activity. It's the day after or two days after. So we want to give them a buffer in between to make sure it's not too sore, right? After those two weeks go well, we would then increase the surfaces, right? We'd increase maybe a rod strip. We would start going on the actual hard beam versus the floor line. We would try to make sure we're doing actual, you know, landings on eight inches on softer surfaces and not the hard, hard ground, but it's not the pit, okay? We would do harder surfaces, 
we would start to increase the difficulty of those skills. So maybe they're running into a round off whip on um, vault instead of doing a Yurchenko or just doing drills. Maybe now they're doing a metal bar uh, stoop stall there's underneath. Maybe they're doing some some jumps and leaps on beam that are about half their, their full percentage of their kicking, but they're not doing their full skills, okay? And we would do moderate volume. So maybe five to seven now, instead of just three to five, we would do that for two weeks as well. And then lastly, the five to six weeks, we would start going harder surfaces. Maybe we do the harder skills on tumble track and the basic skills on floor. So maybe they do their, their fulls and double fulls and double backs on tumble track, but they do their layouts and their, their front tumbling and their front layouts and bounding on floor and mix it up back and forth, right? The skills themselves are harder because we're doing more advanced stuff. And the, the, the volume itself stays about the same of the other two variables being really, really heavy. So harder surfaces, harder skills, but maybe keep the volume the same. So we're not pushing things too fast, too soon. And then lastly, the seven to eight week mark, I usually have people say, okay, you can do whatever you want, but no more than seven of any one skill at a particular time, just to kind of rein in the, the cap a little bit there. So that's kind of the return to sport phase, right? That's the, the full, it might be four weeks. If it goes fast for some people who have just have strains one week of each, it might go, you know, eight plus weeks for someone who has a big hip surgery after, you know, six to nine months of full rehab. So that is the entire phase, right? That's phase one, phase two, phase three, and phase four. And then next let's talk about, okay, what can we do if we want to speed things up a little bit? You know, I, I understand I have to rest all that kind of stuff, but what can I do? And I think these are oftentimes underlooked. Okay. So number one is sleep. I think that people don't realize that you have to have a good high quality of sleep. You know, kids probably need eight plus hours of high quality sleep per night. So if somebody really wants to maximize how fast their hip gets better and how fast they heal, no magic pills, no magic buttons. But if you can have someone consistently try to, you know, get to sleep at the same time, have a nice cool, cool room around 68 degrees, try to avoid any screens or blue light for an hour before bed. If they're drinking coffee, cut the coffee off 10 hours before bed. Um, try to not eat too much before they go to sleep because your stomach will have digestion issues. And then maybe in the morning, start to see some morning sunlight and the evening, see some, some evening sunlight setting. Those things all have been supported by really good research to set your circadian rhythm and give you really high quality of sleep. So that's really important. Proper fueling, proper nutrition is crucial here, right? I think, um, unfortunately, sometimes people think like, oh, I'm not working out, so I'm not going to have as much to eat, but your body's healing. And if you're doing the right thing in strength and conditioning and, and sports performance, you should be working your tail off in PT. You should be working your tail off in the gym to do what you can around your hip injury. So I am not a nutritionist. I am not an expert there, but there are many phenomenal people out there. Christina Anderson, Carrie Blair, Josh Eldridge. There's tons of great people to talk about nutrition, not only in general, but nutrition as it relates to injuries and recovery. So I think that also would be really, really helpful. So another thing that's important to speed up healing is to stay moving, right? Don't just lay there and kind of wait for it to heal. Try to do what you can try to walk, try to be upright, try to do things that are getting you active, gets the blood pumping, get your body going a little bit, right? Rather than just sitting there and waiting for it to heal. Obviously for like two weeks after surgery, you have to do that to respect the healing timeline. But for most people, you can be up, you can be doing stuff, you can be on top of stuff. Okay. And then next, what do we do to prevent this, right? It's like, okay, sounds good. Got the injuries, got the anatomy. We're in dork land. I totally get it. What can I do to prevent this, right? And these are the things for me that I think are most important, okay? Number one is we definitely need better workload management systems, right? We don't understand how hard gymnastics is. We don't know the forces on these hips, right? We need to understand, okay, where does this come from if we want to make a good progression back? So that's kind of like I said, for me and other people to work on is figuring out like how do we monitor surfaces and repetitions and how hard the training load is. But that still needs a lot of attention, I think. We need a lot more research and funding for that to understand spikes and workloads to prevent that. But that really is the most glaring, obvious thing for me that we need to do. Okay. In terms of what you can do as a parent, a medical provider, a coach, whatever, for sure, far by far and away, the two most important for me are great strength and conditioning programs and great flexibility programs, right? If you are respecting workloads, you're planning your practices, you're not throwing a thousand drills you see on Instagram to some poor child who's just brand new to this flexibility circuit. If you're being smart and planning your training, the next best thing to do is to have great strength programs and great flexibility programs. Like there's so much information from myself and others about how do you make a hybrid strength program that uses weight training? When do you start? What exercises? How much weight? You know, how do we prevent some of the concerns that we have? How do we find a great strength, strength coach to work with, right? If you want to reduce the risk of hip injuries or the chronic hamstring strains, the chronic hip flexor stuff, I can't promise you that a strength program will do it, but I can definitely say the research suggests it lowers the risk substantially if you're doing them. So really do a lot of good research to figure out who is awesome to, to talk about in the strength conditioning world for gymnastics specifically. And also do a lot of research on flexibility, right? What are the current science-based flexibility things to get splits and active flexibility that spares the hip joints, doesn't put pressure on those hip joints uh, 
as a global thing, but biases the muscles, biases the things that you want, which is great jumps and leaps and angles and in bars and jams for guys, whatever, but it doesn't stress the hip joints too much. Look up how to do soft tissue work, how to do foam rolling, how to do eccentrics, how to do active flexibility that really, really is high quality. Those two things would make a massive difference on people's program. Okay. Another one I think I mentioned on quickly, but I want to try to talk about again is just understanding how many of certain things you're doing in the day. Like you don't want to be doing all your jumps and leaps on beam and all your jumps and leaps on floor and doing in bars on uh, bars and doing a bunch of sprint work on vault. Like it's a lot of work on someone's hip. So maybe on balance beam, if you do all your jumps and leaps, maybe you can just focus on tumbling one day or turns one day, right? If you do a lot of turns and jumps and leaps on floor, maybe you can do it on beam, but just be really careful about how many stall there's an in bars you do or kips you do on bars work on other things like long hang swings drills uh spotted work metal bar all that kind of stuff so just be aware of you know all that kind of stuff and then uh two more things i'll say one cultural issues early specialization year-round training maybe age guidelines for who's doing harder skills at a young age that's a ball of wax i know that's a really big pandora's box question but um, that needs to definitely be a conversation right like so many injuries are still higher risk because of only doing gymnastics from five years old, not having a break in your year on training and having zero guidance about like how many hours a young kid should do. Uh, I think it's crazy that we have like, you know, 10 year old kids trying to go level 10 and do elite and training 25 to 30 hours per week. Like that's madness to me. And if you, if you do that, maybe you can get away with doing it in a very specifically planned way, but it's going to be really tough to get a 10 year old to do 25 to 30 hours per week for 10, 12 years and not have hip issues. So, um, I really think we need better guidance around that from coaches. So, uh, then lastly, I'll just say is a uh, excellent technique, excellent basics, right? Take the time, teach proper roundoffs, teach proper cartwheels, proper handstands, proper glides, proper kips, proper running. Um, if you, if you skip steps, um, and you, and you don't allow those things to really develop fully, um, that's going to be really challenging sometimes because someone's going to have to go back and refix their round off or refix their in bar or refix their tap swings. And I'll be honest that sometimes you teach all those things and you do it and the gymnasts don't listen. You know, it's just, it's just the reality, but they don't want to put in the work to, to change and you just gotta you say okay well you know i'm here for you if you want to learn and do that but like you know you got to really fix these things if you want to not keep having naggy this or cranky that and all that kind of stuff that technique is so so important all right all right we're at the end here last but not least what do you do if someone is not getting better and these are five things that i have dealt with head on okay so number one if their hip injury is not getting better they're always having problems number one you got to look at the culture right is there a problem with goal mismatch does the coach want one level where the parent wants another or the kid wants another um are, are there maybe just not having good conversations about just too much which is we're pushing the young athletes too much too soon the intensity is too high or we're not using evidence-based strength conditioning we're not using evidence-based um you know flexibility methods um are we doing some very very uh inappropriate flexibility methods or way too much of certain skills are we are we training too much there's a lot of things that could go into this right but communication and, and you know trust is really really important to have someone be comfortable enough to speak up about their hip when it starts to hurt if they don't feel as though they can approach a coach because they're going to get yelled at or dealt with or whatever put in the side and not talked about that's very, very mean, <laughs> but also it's going to make it so their hip injury always comes up because they don't want to talk about it. So culture is by far and away. If the communication lines aren't open, if you're not willing to have hard conversations about some of these things, that's going to be tough. Okay. On the other side, sometimes the rehab program is not hard enough. Like I think I've, I've met a lot of medical providers who I love and they're great. They work very, very hard to be current, but I've also met some who really don't understand gymnastics and they really don't understand strength and conditioning. So that needs to be importantly dealt with, right? If you're just doing clamshell exercises and side band walks for six weeks in PT and basic core stuff, you're never going to train your hip as much as you need to get back to gymnastics, right? We talked about split squats, step ups, med ball slams, hurdle hops, sled pushes, I, all those things need to happen. And I understand I used to work in insurance. Sometimes insurance companies will not give you the visits and they'll cut you off. You still need to work on those things regardless, whether it's a strength coach, whether it's talking with the medical provider, getting a home program and doing it with a strength coach or in the gym, you have to find a way to do those or else you're going to, you're going to jump steps and you're not going to be ready. You're going to go back, your hips going to flare up again and you're back in PT. So make sure that the PT is hard enough. Three, you could just be going back too soon, right? You could just be rushing through those eight weeks and say, okay, I'm excited. I want to do gymnastics and I'm just going to go back and try a bunch of stuff, right? If you go from not doing anything for four to six weeks and then just dive right back into all your jumps, all your leaps, all your in bars, or you're sprinting, for example, it can be very easy to make your hamstring flare back up. So respect that slow progress back, even if you don't have pain. Right? Even if you don't have pain, it doesn't mean that you're ready to do really high level gymnastics. It can take up to four to six weeks to really slowly go through all those kind of things with two days off in between or one day off in between to monitor your symptoms. Okay. Four skill technique, right? If you don't take time to really go back, relearn that area all the right way, 
relearn that round off the right way. Find someone who can teach you a proper round off, relearn your in bar drops, you know, relearn some of your, your uh, jamming skills and your hamstring stuff to not bottom out the bottom. You have to fix those technique issues. And sometimes again, you tell a gymnast they should do this. You want to do all the stuff. It's all good and well. And this really, they just don't put the pedal to the metal and, and take the initiative to change those things. And you do the best you can, you know, you, you meet someone halfway and say, this is it. But you know, the reality is that you're, you're unfortunately not going to have a lot of great progress until we fix these issues at a fundamental level, or maybe you just need to get stronger. Maybe we just need to work on flexibility for a couple of weeks, stuff like that. Okay. And then lastly, along with the lack of patience to return to sport is the lack of patience with growth and development. So again, these are kids, these are children who are um, growing rapidly. And sometimes I look at people and I say, listen, you're doing everything right. You're doing the exercises, you're doing the strength, you're doing everything you possibly need but you're 10 years old, you're 12 years old, and you're growing very, very fast. And you're doing very, very high level gymnastics. And I get it. It's fun. But your body is just telling you that you need to just let yourself calm down and adapt and you'll get through this growth spurt a little bit. So as much as I love it, and it breaks my heart to say it, I tell people like, listen, this is just going to be a time thing. You know, just keep doing your work, keep doing what you can, but your hamstring is just going to keep being cranky until you get through a growth phase. So yeah, that's what it is. Um, all right. And as, as I hope to do, I wanted to finish under two hours and here we are. So I apologize for that monstrous episode. We'll timestamp everything. You can get all the information you need. I wanted to make sure people had everything they possibly needed, um, to kind of get in here. And if you, if you want to learn more, we have way more resources, medical providers. We have an entire course on every exercise I do, every treatment I do to help with all these injuries. Um, the slides that we showed were from that. If you want to just check out more and you want to just see more hip active flexibility drills or strength circuits, we have the hero lab, which is a monthly membership for coaches as well. You can hop in there too. So I hope you all found this helpful. If you got all the way through this, God bless you. You're amazing. Do us a massive favor and please share this with people, share it with people, you know, uh, the, we give this away for free, right? So the more people that know about it, the better off it is so that we can just spread awareness around it. So uh, I hope this was all helpful. Uh, if you guys want to see more, the blog has literally all of this in written form. So you can go back and you can visit this and uh, we should be good. All right. Have a great day.